With a level-up system from God, Hunter becomes the strongest player. The Anaim begins three years earlier than the current day where the army is attacking an island, but the fighters realize that their weapons are ineffective against the forces they are facing. Therefore, they must leave it to the hunters because it is the only alternative. Inside the island, a troop of hunters forms up to deal with an approaching swarm of ants. At the moment the insects attack, the regiment captain encourages his troops to hold off the enemies as much as possible, or else the vanguard will be vulnerable. Despite their efforts, the hunters' rank was too low, and they ended up becoming easy prey for the giant insects. The captain is eaten alive while feeling his life fading before his eyes until another hunter eliminates the ant with his club and heals the fighter. However, another group of ants attacks the healer, but another member of the hunter team appears and seeing Byung in danger electrocutes the enemies from a distance. The last member of the team, Yunho, uses his devastating physical strength to secure the front line, while the healer finishes his work with the wounded in the field. Impressed by all that talent, the defeated squadron watches as the S-rank hunters resolve the situation. Unsuk, the member with electric claws, asks his healer not to rush ahead, but Byung just wanted to help as many people as he could. Besides, he was sure his two friends would come to protect him. At that moment, a gigantic ant appears on the battlefield, but despite its size and intimidating appearance, the S-ranked team advances against the opponent. While Yunho holds the ant by its jaws, Munsook injures it with his electricity. Then Yunho tears off the insect's jaws with his own hands and hurls one of the ant's claws at it with absurd force, piercing the giant's body. But several other identical ants appear and Yunho activates an ability that makes him even more powerful, while Unsiv unleashes tremendous lightning on the battlefield. The amount of power is so great that it can be seen from the other side of the island, where the commander of another troop realizes that the S-rank has arrived in time. Nevertheless, Master Choi had his own battle to win, and when the enemy horde approaches, the leader burns all the weaker ants and orders his troops to advance against the rest of them. In the meantime, the context of the situation is explained. Over ten years ago, a series of portals appeared connecting our world to an alternate dimension. The other side of each portal was filled with bizarre creatures called magic monsters. Those who awaken abilities to face these monsters, which are immune to conventional weapons, are called hunters. Based on their natural power, they are classified in descending order as S, A, B, C, D, or E rank. However, once this power awakens, it cannot be increased through any individual effort. Three years later, a portal has a whole structure to serve the purposes of the hunters, while a group of lower-class hunters gathers around to pass the time and prepare for excursions into dungeons. At this moment, a food truck attendant gives coffee to one of them and wishes him good luck on the raid. One of his friends, Park, arrives at this moment and greets Kim. Kim is surprised by his friend's arrival since he had said he was tired of hunting, but the man responds that his wife is pregnant with their second child, so he needs to earn money from raids because diapers aren't free. And at that moment, the protagonist arrives and all the hunters are messing with a guy, greeting him or making some joke. Since he drew attention upon arrival, Park asks if the guy is so strong that everyone wants to talk to him. However, Kim claims it's the opposite. As the boy is known as the weakest hunter of humanity, people kind of adopted him as a mascot, so he is well known. Once he ended up in the hospital after participating in an E-rank mission. At least when he is called, everyone already knows that the raid will be easy. And as some approaches, the two hunters try to lower their voices so the guy doesn't hear, but he had already heard everything, resigned to not being able to argue against facts. Right in front of him, his friend Joki shows concern for Jun Wu Sung being hurt once again and insists on knowing the origin of the wound, even though the guy avoids talking about it. Then he comments on the case known among the hunters, the famous E rank portal raid, where Jin Wu was the only one injured and went straight to the hospital. Since all the other hunters were of higher rank, no one saw the need to bring a healer, so it fell to the young man who ended up lagging behind. Betrui argues that they were selfish and didn't think about the group's needs, but Jin Wu takes responsibility, saying it's his fault for being weak, and that he's already used to being treated that way. The raid is about to begin, and one of the hunters volunteers to be a group leader. Since everyone around recognizes that Song Chiel is the most skilled of all, there was no objection. Soon, the team enters the portal, and before Sung enters, Kim asks him to stay behind the rest of the group and be careful not to get hurt. Joey tries to motivate the boy and also enters, while he stays behind and observes his knife with almost no magical power, which was the only thing he managed to buy. Still, it's better than nothing, so Jun Wu Sung promises to do his best this time. Far away, the president of the Hunter Association, Go Gunny, talks to his assistant, reporting that the conversation with the government was the same as always. They accuse Dungeon Breaks of being a problem, but still want the resources that hunters collect from them. Though doesn't mind them wanting a piece of the pie, but he wishes there wasn't so much hypocrisy in it. 
After all, dungeons are the livelihood of hunters, they live off what they sell from these dungeons, and the most valuable example of this is the stones collected from defeated monsters, essence stones. And finally, Jinwu achieved his first victory after putting in a lot of effort for it. Despite that, another creature emerged, attacking him. No matter how hard he tried to confront it, when attempting to thrust his knife into the enemy, his weapon was completely shattered. In return, the monster drove a sword into the boy's abdomen. Park arrived at that moment and eliminated the enemy, but he soon had to return to the front lines and Sun was bleeding heavily. So Jiri took charge of healing her friend. While receiving treatment, Sun observed the fight of his companions. His vision grew blurrier as he wished he could be there in the battle. Returning to the president, he explained that the most expensive essence stones are collected from the strongest monsters. These stones can be transformed into powerful weapons and equipment to fight against other monsters. In addition to these stones, mana crystals serve the same purpose but are less potent. The assistant then asked if the government had another intention in using these items. Go explained that their intention was to use the materials as a source of energy, as it is a cheaper and more efficient form of energy than current ones, and it also pollutes the environment less. This is why there is so much pressure on the hunters. The cleanest and most effective energy source comes only from resources extracted from dungeons. In Sum's mission, the team finally defeated the dungeon boss. Seeing everyone celebrating the victory, Joey asked her friend if he continues trying to be a hunter out of stubbornness. After all, if he continues like this, something more serious could happen at any moment. Today, for example, the injury was not just in the abdomen, but throughout the body. Sun apologized for the trouble, but Joey scolded him, saying she doesn't want apologies, she's just worried about him. Meanwhile, other hunters were collecting loot, but this dungeon didn't have many mana crystals. Everyone was worried about the payment they would receive from selling the items. Sung at least only had the rank E essence stone that he obtained almost at the cost of his life. During this time, the hunter discovered a tunnel inside the dungeon, indicating it was a double dungeon, a new opportunity to get quality loot. However, the squad leader was cautious and informed his subordinates that, in extraordinary cases like this, the standard procedure is to await orders from the Hunter Association. Other members questioned this stance, fearing they would send other hunters who would take the remaining loot. Besides, the tunnel was still part of this Rank D dungeon, so there shouldn't be a problem. Song Chiel decided to take a vote on whether to enter the tunnel or not. It ended in a tie 6 to 6. However, some hadn't voted yet, so he was responsible for the tiebreaker. He considered that a D ranked dungeon was too dangerous for him, but since his father was missing, he was the sole provider for his family. So he had no choice. He needed to pay for his mother's treatment and his sister's college. After his reflection, he chose to dive in. In the moment when the weakest hunter seeks his breakthrough, Hunter Association is recruiting new members. Candidates line up to test their abilities, and an examiner evaluates each one's rank with a black sphere that citizens touch for scanning. A representative passes the results to Master Choi, informing him that a B rank and two C ranks join the guild. The chief emphasizes that gender and age don't matter. If a person has talent, they must receive a contract offer, even if they're not a chaha. Meanwhile, in the most Brazilian street in the Anime, two guys on a motorcycle snatch a purse from a girl and speed away with the victim's belongings. Along the way, a woman in a pink cap stands in the middle of the street, making the thugs nervous. They continue accelerating and the woman jumps over them, surgically retrieving the purse. In the process, the motorcycle skids, and the woman returns the bag to the victim. The entire population witnesses this act of heroism and approaches Hunter Chaha, a renowned S-rank associate, for a photo. Before being photographed, she expresses annoyance at all the attention and leaves for some peace. Back in the dungeon, 40 minutes have passed since they entered the tunnel. Since the portal stays open for an hour after defeating the boss, they still have 20 minutes to get what they need and leave. Jin Sung takes the opportunity to apologize again for putting them in this new predicament, as Joey voted against the new expedition. However, she gets irritated and reminds him that he would be dead if the sword strike had been a bit higher, so he should be more careful before entering places even more dangerous than those that nearly took his life for good. Shinwu reflects on the scolding and acknowledges that having a B-rank healer by his side is a significant advantage. The girl asks to be rewarded with a dinner, and Jinwu's reaction makes it seem like he'd prefer another sword in the stomach. Further ahead, the group reaches the boss's chamber. Even though the colossal gate looks intimidating, no one wants to leave empty-handed, so they decide to enter anyway, considering they've come this far. Before that, the president of the Hunter Association introduces himself to the newly awakened and warns that no one is obliged to become a hunter, but once they make that choice, they must remain vigilant at all times, no matter how powerful they may be. As a final piece of advice, he asks all candidates to fear because fear keeps the courageous alive. Thus, the expedition group enters the boss's room and finds several ancient statues. 
Among them, one holds inscriptions about the commandments of the Temple of Kartanon. The leader of the hunters steps forward and begins to read. First, worship God. Second, praise God. Third, prove your faith in God. As the leader recites each commandment, Jomi notices that the largest statue moves its eyes and calls Jinwu to look, but the protagonist believes it's just in her imagination. Finally, Song Chiol reads the last commandment, stating that those who do not follow these words will not leave alive. With that, the gate closes and everyone is in shock. A hunter revolts at being put in that situation and leaves the group attempting to escape. However, one of the statues comes to life and ends the man with its axe before he can try to open the gate. As she annihilated a D-rank hunter as if it were nothing, it makes no sense to have a monster of that level in this lower-level dungeon. Regardless, there's no way out, so some begins to imagine what will become of him. And it was at that moment that the largest statue in the room turns its eyes toward the protagonist. Despite this, Jun Wu Sung recalls that he has been close to death many times before. In the first instance, he separated from the group on a raid and ended up trapped. Next, he was attacked by E-rank monsters and spent weeks in the hospital. Furthermore, he almost died of hunger in a labyrinth. No matter how low the dungeon rank was for him, it was always a matter of life or death. Unlike more skilled hunters who can defeat strong monsters and obtain rare items, all he had was a useless knife, and since it broke, he'll have to fight empty-handed. For reasons like these, some learn that he should observe and wait for a good opportunity, as he is not capable of charging into a raid head-on. And it was this realization that kept him alive until today, even through hardships. Soon, he shouts for the entire group to duck, while the statue spews lava from its eyes, sweeping through a significant portion of the hunters. Looking around, everyone present is overcome by panic and helplessness, as chaos unfolds in the eyes of each hunter trapped in that chamber, and Jin Wu Sun has no doubt that you won't leave there alive. All around, the hunters tried to seize the brief respite to plan some kind of countermove, but everything seemed too small in the face of the enormity of the enemy. In the meantime, Jin Wu Sun attempted to assist the unconscious Zhou Yi, incapacitated by the attack. Song Xiu expressed gratitude to the young boy for his insight, acknowledging that he had anticipated the attack, instructing everyone to take cover, thus saving some lives. Jin Wu observed their leader and noticed his arm had been torn off. The experienced leader bravely tried to keep the young man calm, reassuring him that clenching his teeth would make the pain bearable. However, they needed to stop the bleeding before things took a turn for the worse, so Jin Wu did his part and covered the wound with gauze. During this act, Chiu mentioned he would have asked for treatment for Jogi, but she didn't handle pressure well and usually participated only in easy raids despite being a B-rank healer. He shared that he had been in two B-rank raids himself and had no doubt that this enemy belonged to Class A, maybe even S. As for the temple commandments written on that plaque, they likely referred to a deity represented by the statue. Along with the portals, various supernatural phenomena began occurring in the world. Some of these phenomena affected the hunters, while monsters behind these portals accumulated unimaginable powers. Meanwhile, far away at a school, the protagonist's sister, Jana Sung, talked with a friend. The short-haired girl asked if Jana's brother was indeed a hunter. She confirmed it, mentioning he was an E-rank and usually came home bandaged from his missions. When asked about the interest, the girl evaded the question, whispering that she could surely do a better job than that E-rank hunter. Back in the dungeon, the leader argued that the enemy was too powerful to be destroyed, so they needed to stay calm, assess the situation, and find a safe way out. Despite the precaution, a team member rushed and refused to die there, having just signed a contract with a major guild. Trusting his speed, he assured he could cross the gate before being caught. However, before reaching halfway, the statue almost completely destroyed the speedster's body, leaving only his feet behind. Undoubtedly, this was the last evidence they needed to understand that this creature could annihilate them in the blink of an eye. The big question was why it hadn't eliminated them all yet, and perhaps the reason was a hint on exit. Therefore, Jin Wu Sung used his wits and asked his leader to recall the first commandment of Kartnan, venerate God. Interpreting the phrase, Jin Wu Sung stood up in search of a solution. Despite Chiul's concern about the young man's unexpected reaction, something in his eyes indicated that he hadn't given up on life. Analyzing the commandment, the young man asked the rest of the group to bow before the statue, simulating the veneration that the god demanded. The hunters were confused and skeptical about the effectiveness of this measure, but with no better ideas at the moment, they all joined the plan. The veneration caused a movement in the statue, changing its face to a sinister expression. After a few tense seconds, the group began to question the next step. Park felt confident enough to stand up, believing the statue had stopped attacking. Following suit, the others stood up, but the tension was far from over because the giant statue then rose from its throne with that sinister expression and began to chase the guild. 
Although Song Xiu was the leader, the group pressured Jun Wusung to come up with the next step. Obviously, the answer would be in the second commandment, but the intense pressure on the young man prevented him from finding a way out. That's when a scholar of ethnology, the in-depth study of societies and their culture, took responsibility. This reading reminded the hunter of some exaltations to the gods. Applying his knowledge to the statue, he knelt down and offered a kind of prayer. While the ethnologist prayed, the statue lifted its foot higher and higher until it stepped on him as if he were an insect. This triggered chaos and everyone began to run in pure desperation. Panic robbed a hunter of her reaction, and she too was mercilessly trampled. As he ran, Park remembered his family waiting at home with his second child about to be born. He tried to find a safer spot, but turning his back to another statue, it used its sword to cut Park in half. Meanwhile, Jinwoo was thinking of any possible clue to praise that cursed demon. So he observed his surroundings again and seeing the statues around him, noted that the first one held a spear, the second an axe, the next a hammer, followed by a sword, and then a trumpet. Intuitively, he predicted that the statues with musical instruments were peaceful. He instructed each member to run to one. But as he reached a statue with a drum, the instrument's music didn't play. Supposing that it would only work if only one person stayed with each statue, he left Joey in safety and moved on to the next. As the only target in the field, the god went after Sun, who sprinted to the last alternative. At the moment, he would be crushed. He managed to jump and reach the statue he wanted. However, it was dark and he didn't see that the statue actually held a shield, not a musical instrument. It raised the weapon and struck the young hunter. Despite the brutal force of the impact, Jin Wu Sung survived and crawled towards the last instrument. Severely injured, he reached his destination just as the gods stepped near his body. Nevertheless, the statue released its angelic voice, and with the praise of all the instruments playing together, the demon god sat back down. Joey chases after his friend, who is severely weakened. As if that's not enough, the statue's final stomp ends up taking the hunter's right leg. Jovi rushes to stop the bleeding, while she herself begins to bleed from all the openings on her face due to the difficulty of the wound. After the definitive end of the conflict, guild members exchange glances and assess the losses. Soon, they seek to find someone to blame for the tragedy that followed the vote to enter the tunnel. After all fingers are pointed, Song Chiel takes responsibility since he is the leader and in charge of the final word. Despite the heated discussion, the god raises his hand and the ground trembles, making the group think it's an earthquake. However, Jin Wu explains to the group that the statue was raising an altar in the center of the hall. As in many myths and cultures, gods demand sacrifices and offerings in their name. Following the third commandment, the next step is to prove your faith in God. In these moments, men need to distinguish themselves from boys, and Kim takes the first move, pointing his sword at Chiel, as he should bear the dishonor of failing in his leadership. Other members try to stop the action, but the leader himself surrenders to the sacrifice and goes to the altar. Their flames ignite around the ritual, but as nothing else happens, Jin Wu Sung asks for help to examine the altar closely. He spends some seconds trying to discern the next step, but with little success. Finally, he considers the possibility of someone coming to rescue them if they continue to wait. However, as the portal has been open for seven days, the group fears that the statues may start moving again at any moment. After all, it takes a week for the portal to open completely. This process is called a dungeon break, and when it happens, monsters can cross over. In their case, if they fail, the demon god can enter the real world. Unaware of the ongoing events, Jina Sung visits her mother, undergoing a painful treatment. Even with her unconscious, Jina updates her on recent matters, discusses her friends, and talks about the national exam results. Then, Jin Wu Sung calls the other members into the altar's circle, anticipating that they will need one person for each flame. Once done, blue fire surrounds the circle and the gate opens. However, the statues in the hall emit a strange glow and move toward the center, leaving the group uncertain about the next move. At this point, Jin Wu discovers that the statues stop moving when you keep your eyes on them. Therefore, everyone must keep their eyes on the enemies until they figure out an escape. However, one hunter panics and decides to run for her life, leaving everything behind. As she crosses the altar line, one of the flames extinguishes and the gate closes a bit. This opens the group's eyes to the intention of the third commandment, to test faith in God with an extreme situation like this. Regardless, this assumption doesn't confirm if they are facing a trap or not. Next, another member tries his luck and crosses the gate, repeating the process of extinguishing another flame and closing the gate a bit more. As he was the last support for the legless comrade, the protagonist falls to the ground. After this escape, Jin Wu Sung tells everyone not to leave because if they do, they will have a blind spot and won't be able to prevent the arrival of enemies. He assumes that the blue flames mark the time, so they can leave once they go out. Kim praises the boy's intelligence, especially since he has been labeled as useless since joining the association. 
However, Kim has a family waiting for him so he doesn't want to die now. Therefore, Kim apologizes and flees the chamber. The three survivors now have a blind spot since they don't have enough eyes to cover all statue surroundings. In other words, they can no longer prevent the statues from approaching. Jim Woo starts to cry for coming so far and failing, despite surviving many challenges that tested him. But before the end, Song Chiel tells the two young ones to leave. According to him, it's evident that the gate will close after the penultimate survivor leaves. Since the two still have a long life ahead, they should go. He asks Jogi to take care of some, and as the healer prepares to take her companion away, her legs lock and she can't move them. The leader thinks she exerted herself too much to heal some, but some action needed to be taken as the siege was about to close in. For this reason, Jun Wu Sung tells Chiel to carry the healer outside. The leader starts to argue, but the protagonist insists loudly that he should take her immediately, because there is no other alternative, considering he is without a leg. Joe panics and tries to convince her friend to change his mind, but his response is to give his magic stone to the girl, considering she had invited him to lunch earlier. With this, she could earn some money and buy a special lunch when Jinwoo returns. He promises to get the change from her. Even so, Joey continues to protest, but with no more time to spare, Song Chiul knocks out the young girl and carries her outside. And as soon as the two leave, Jinwoo Sung is alone with all those statues around him. Without his leg to run, just waiting for his end, sitting and defenseless. Despite everything, he feels it should have been like this from the beginning. After all, he has always been the weakest hunter. If he knew it would be like this, he would have definitely taken out a higher life insurance policy. Finally, he raises the sword left by Kim and intends to take at least one enemy with him. At that moment, a statue throws its giant sword at the boy, but it sticks into the altar near him. Another statue hits the ground, causing Jinwoo to roll with the impact, leaving him completely exposed to the enormous enemies. With that, the next blow is accurate, tearing off one of the hunter's arms. Praying for his end, the boy remained on the ground with no reaction, just lamenting not having another chance to do things differently. Meanwhile, another statue crushed his body with its hammer, breaking his bones. At that moment, despite the pain, Jin Woo Sung is proud of having at least reached this point. As he tries to stand again, a colossal statue pierces his right shoulder completely, impaling the boy on the wall. Miraculously alive, he spends his final moments harboring hatred for hunters like Kim, despising the fact that he said he couldn't take it anymore and had to leave. After all, it's logical that nobody could endure being there anymore, he was just justifying his own selfishness. It's always the most selfish ones who benefit the most. Jinwoo has a terminally ill mother, but even so, he decided to sacrifice himself for the group, leaving her and his sister alone, only to end up being massacred in the most painful and lonely way possible. Next, the sword piercing Jinwoo is lifted high, causing extreme pain to the hunter, who is then thrown from a height of 20 meters and falls backward onto the sacrificial altar. His blood flows rapidly from his body as he cries and changes his mind. Now he feels that he doesn't want to die anymore, but it's too late. One of the statues then delivers the coup de grace to the protagonist, extinguishing the last blue flame. Following this, a screen opens with a notification about a secret mission called Courage of the Weak. This notification alerts someone that they have acquired the necessary qualifications to be a player, and then asks if they accept. Once the proposal is confirmed, another screen opens, warning that this person's heart will stop in 0.02 seconds if they don't accept, and then other options between yes and no are presented on the screen. In the end, the player goes ahead and accepts again. Suddenly, Jun Woo Sung wakes up in a hospital bed. Desperate, he looks over his entire body, recalling the limbs that were crushed by the giant statues. However, his body was intact with all his arms and legs and there was no sign of the chest puncture. At this moment, two men enter the room and one of them introduces himself as Wu Jinshul, the administrator of the surveillance team of the Hunter Association. Beside him is an assistant named Kang Tashik. First and foremost, Jin Woo Sung wants to know what surveillance wants with him. Wu informs him that the boy was unconscious for three days. As for his mission companions, Song Chiel lost an arm and probably won't be able to work as a hunter anymore. Lee Jo Hee, on the other hand, is traumatized and receiving psychiatric treatment. Due to her condition, the administrator is unsure if she will continue in the profession. Considering that only six hunters survived this dungeon and everyone knows it's a very dangerous job. Despite the tragic outcomes, Wu mentions that such incidents are rare. Now regarding why they are there, when the White Tiger Guild arrived at the location after being informed by the survivors, they only found Jin Wu Sung lying on the ground, with no trace of the statues or the temple described by the survivors. However, since there was no inconsistency in the report and the remains of the deceased were at the scene, Jin Wu's group was removed from the list of suspects. By the way, the administrator asks if the boy had his second awakening. 
The awakening determines a hunter's power and is supposed to be unchangeable. However, in rare cases, a hunter can undergo a second awakening. This bypasses the rule of immutable power and can elevate a hunter to rank A or even S. To measure the protagonist's new strength, a mana meter is brought to him. Since he survived instant death level monsters, it's highly likely they are facing a new prodigy. After Jinwoo places his hand on the device, the screen displays the number 10. He was excited to discover his new rank and insists that the surveillance team reveal the result quickly. However, Wu Jinchul informs him that he misunderstood and apologizes to the young man. Outside, Kang Tashik seems frustrated with the test result. Even E-rank hunters can reach up to 70 points on the meter, so it's as if Jin Wu Sung is just a civilian based on his score. While Kang expresses his dissatisfaction, Wu Jinchul thinks that the dungeon has disappeared, and there's no way to explore it again to figure out how that boy survived. Back to the young man, he laments not getting a good score as he was hoping to level up. But above all, Jinwoo is confused that no one asked about the strange interface that looks like a video game, indicating that he had an unread message. This makes him think that only he can see this thing. He tries to touch the interface, but realizes it's not a touch screen. The more he concentrates on it, the more some memories come back to him, like when he was about to die and this same screen appeared, saying he met the conditions to be a player and asking if he wanted to enter a mission called Courage of the Weak. Next, his sister appears in the hospital scolding him for not taking care of himself again. Almost every mission he comes back unharmed, but he remains a punching bag. However, as it was a genuine concern, Jinwoo smiles slightly at Gina's scolding. This leads her to think she's being sarcastic, so she threatens to quit studying and get a job if he continues to get injured, as one day, he'll end up crippled and unemployed. Acknowledging his sister's point, Jinwoo agrees to take it easy and then asks if Gina can see the strange interface in front of him. She thinks a doctor needs to examine his head but plays along. As a gamer, Jinwoo explains that this interface looks like a virtual game, asking what to do when an unread message notification appears in a game. Jinna explains that normally you just open the message box. As the boy repeats his sister's words, the voice command shows the messages. The first one informs him that he has become a player, and the other says that the daily mission called Strength Training has arrived. Jinwoo tries to remember where he heard the word player, while Jina sees that her brother is fine and says goodbye. Outside, she meets her friend Song again, who believes she is more useful than Jinwoo as a hunter. Meanwhile, the boy delves deeper into the virtual menu, discovering that it is designed to assist in the player's development and not fulfilling the system's determination can result in a penalty. Finally, a third screen indicates that the rewards have already been delivered to him. He still doesn't understand what's going on, so he goes into the details of the strength training mission to take a look. The daily goal was to perform 100 push-ups, 100 squats, 100 sit-ups, and run 10 kilometers. If the player doesn't complete this mission, they will suffer a penalty. Jin Sun thinks it's just a joke and tries to figure out how he could possibly do all that in his current state. But while lying down and not taking it seriously, a countdown in the menu is running out. In the meantime, the surveillance team administrator informs President Go that the young hunter, Jin Sun did not have a second awakening. Over the phone, Go is relieved that at least this case didn't cause a dungeon break, but there's still something fishy about this story. Therefore, the boss instructs surveillance to leave this dungeon in the database for further evaluation. Meanwhile, Master Choi invites Cha Ha to be instructor for the upcoming B-Rank raid because it will be an important expedition to select new recruits for the institution. However, Cha Ha doesn't feel very confident in her mentoring skills. So Choi explains that all she needs to do is fight normally as she always does, and her performance will serve as an example for the less experienced. After that, he explains that the Hunter Guild is one of the country's top five guilds, but on an international level, they are still small. And although individual levels cannot be evolved, collective training will always be a differentiator, especially now that they are preparing for a very special moment. Later, a portal opens in the middle of a road and civilians wonder when the hunters will arrive to solve this problem. Meanwhile, Jinwoo, who was in the middle of his sleep, receives a mission failure message and as a penalty, an earthquake shakes his room and the boy is teleported to an unknown place. Without understanding what happened, he encounters a giant desert centipede, while the panel reappears, stating that it's a punitive survival mission and the goal is to stay alive for four hours. Meanwhile, nurses realize that one of the patients is missing, and even after two hours of him fleeing from a monstrous insect, the staff is clueless and doesn't know where to look for Jinwoo. Thus, the boy remains trapped in that alternate world until the countdown ends, and just as the creature is about to strike, time runs out and the desperate boy returns directly to the hospital, receiving the news that he completed the mission and a reward has been granted to him. However, before he can retrieve the item, nurses enter his room and start assisting him. 
The next day, Jaina is on the phone with her brother and asks him to cover for her at Chaitel, since Jinwu has caused her so much trouble again. In the meantime, Joey is summoned for a ranked D raid, and despite the association knowing that she's going through a tough time, the rest of the guild is busy, so she's the only option at the moment. Despite this, Joey declines the proposal, but at least learns that Jinwu has significantly improved his condition. Happy with the news, she goes straight to visit her friend, but instead of continuing to rest, he is running around the hospital courtyard like crazy. Nurses comment that hunters recover faster than normal people, but what this boy is doing is unbelievable. Finally taking his daily mission seriously, Jinwu Sun discovers that each time he completes them he receives three rewards. The first is total recovery, where all his exhaustion disappears. Second, some points to distribute among his attributes, and as always, he pays more attention to strength. In addition, there is even a skills and inventory screen making his life really look like a game. And at this moment, as he reflects on his new path and navigates his imaginary menu, all the patients look at him as if the boy is from another world. Finally, the third reward is a ram and loot box. In this case, the item is a strange key. Until now, he had only obtained useless things like bandages or pens, so it seems that luck has finally arrived. According to the item description, Jin Woo Sung could use this key to teleport to an instance dungeon. The way to use this item is by reaching exit 3 of the Hapjong subway station. However, Jin Woo has no idea what an instance dungeon is, but it seems like some mission for him to evolve his strength, or at least he hopes so. And during these reflections, the image of that giant macabre statue invades the protagonist's mind, causing physical pain as well. In the meantime, local newspapers report that several Rank D portals have opened around the country, and Rank C portals in the Upper and Central East are being resolved at this very moment. The Rank B portal that appeared in the port area has a raid scheduled in a few days by the Hunter Association. Jim Wusong takes advantage of his improvement to visit his mother, and her image lying like that reminds the boy of a scene from four years ago when he held her in his arms after finding her unconscious. As soon as he takes the woman to the doctor, he and his sister discover that the mother has the eternal sleep disease also known as final rest. It is a disease that emerged with the appearance of portals and affects approximately one in every 10,000 people. There are theories that it is caused by frequent exposure to mana, but regardless, the best that current medicine can offer to those with this disease is support, keeping the person alive but with no chance of recovery. So knowing that he will have to take care of his comatose mother for the rest of her existence, Jin Wu Sung endured the most arduous and humiliating tasks until he was accepted by the Hunter Association and had a salary that provided access to proper treatment for his mother. But soon he discovers that this profession is far from easy, and in the first few days he already realizes this, falling behind in most raids and getting injured frequently. In one of these expeditions, Jin Wu is kicked out of the group for not being able to help, and when the rest of the team makes it clear that even though they ordered him to leave, he won't receive payment since he didn't contribute. Worst of all, Junwoo turned to them and apologized for being useless, on top of it all. Probably, this memory is the greatest incentive for him to focus so much on strength attribute points. Next, he embarks on his first solo mission and upon reaching exit 3 of the Hapjong subway station, he opens a lock that formed in front of him, and a portal opens. Upon crossing, he receives a message notifying him that he has entered the instance dungeon. The entrance behind him closes, but people around him continue to cross as if nothing is happening. With this, Junwoo realizes that instance dungeons place him in a different dimension, just like red portals. Then he receives another message saying that he cannot leave until he kills the boss or uses a teleportation stone. Thus, he descends the stairs and comes face to face with three goblins. Images of him being gravely wounded by a creature of this race come back to him instantly, but this time he has no choice. No one there can help, and there is no easy way out of this dungeon. For this reason, he faces the enemies head-on, defending against their attacks until finding an opening for an offensive move, and on the first try, he slashes through a monster with his sword. Then he pierces the second goblin and also eliminates the last one. Thus, even though he is exhausted, he notices that he is indeed stronger. But now he really has to put it to the test as a lichen with a metal jaw enters the fray and destroys his knife. Jin Wu Sung's legs start to tremble, and sensing the fear, the lichen attacks again, slashing a cut on the hunter's face. After that, the wolf turns back to the target and advances again, each time closer to victory. To avoid the worst, Jin Wu manages to jump to avoid being hit by the pounce. After somersaulting in the air during the evasion, he realizes how light his body has become. Nevertheless, the lichen doesn't give up and prepares to attack again. Jinwoo, tired of taking beatings without retaliating, responds to the lichen's charge with a punch. The impact is so strong that it finally makes the protagonist feel the difference after investing so many points in his attributes. However, even this increase in strength is not enough to defeat the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
Moreover, Jinwu has no group to cooperate in this fight, so it's just him against the opponent. Furthermore, Jinwu only has food and water in his backpack, lamenting the fact that he has no magical weapon to defend himself. But at that moment, he recalls his last dungeon raid and pulls out his magical sword from the inventory, countering the lichen and leveling up. Jinwu remembers that he took the sword from Kim when he fled the statue dungeon, and that he paid 3 million for it. Next, two more lichens approach, but Jinwu no longer fears them because of his new weapon. The problem is that it got stuck in the ground with the last blow, causing the protagonist to panic. The lichens take advantage to attack, but Jinwu manages to pull the sword from the ground and strike. One opponent uses its steel fangs to hold the sword, but Jinwu kicks the monster, and then manages to make the cut with his weapon, destroying another enemy. Despite the difficulty, Jinwu recalls the giant statues that tore him apart without mercy, and at least finds comfort in not facing a challenge of that magnitude. Regardless, it seems that the lichen also briefly reflects on the danger is facing and decides to run away to avoid being destroyed. So Jinwu has some time to sit, and analyzing his inventory realizes that he has leveled up, and his wounds have been healed. Moreover, he gained one point for each attribute. Since daily missions only gave one point, he decides to focus on these fights to evolve. He also wonders if he should put points into other attributes like intelligence or dexterity, but concludes that it makes more sense to continue focusing on strength. Even with only 32 points in this attribute, he already feels his body much lighter. In the end, although he is not sure, he supposes that the higher his basic attributes increase, the more points he will gain. This gives him hope that one day he will truly become very strong. Then he looks for essence stones in the loot, but no such item is found. At least he discovers that there is a shop in the inventory, although newcomers cannot buy items. So he sells a lichen fang he found in the spoils and gets 20 gold coins. Jinwu knows he needs to clear this dungeon before his food runs out, but he's not sure if he can defeat a boss alone, even if it's an E-level dungeon. He could find the teleportation stone, but he has no idea where to look. Therefore, the best idea is to level up in this dungeon until he can face the boss. To continue on a positive note, dozens of lichens approach the boy and attack him, but even in the face of so many enemies, he feels no fear because he has already witnessed his own death once. Therefore, he engages in combat and manages to get rid of some creatures. He knows that even though it is not easy to defeat him, it is also not simple to deal with so many lichens in a group, so it is always valid to be cautious. At this moment, he remembers when he struggled in normal jobs until he received the news that he qualified to be a hunter. He hoped to pay for his mother's treatment, but then remembered the moment when he was killed by the giant statues. With these memories in mind, Jinwu promises to fight with intensity and advances against the opponents. He kills so many lichens that, in addition to leveling up several times, he earns the title of Wolf Slayer. Meanwhile, some city pedestrians notice that a tunnel is becoming dangerous and wonder when the Hunter Association will do something about it, as there is a real risk of a dungeon break. Back at the station, Jinwu sees that his sword is cracking from excessive use, so he wonders if it's time to leave. Meanwhile, his menu explains that players who achieve the title of Wolf Slayer have a 40% bonus in all attributes against animals. In addition, he sees that he has obtained 34 wolf fangs, two worn daggers, and a traveler's cape. But last and most important, he notices that he has obtained the teleportation stone. The acquisition of this item rekindles the doubt of whether to leave or not, but Jinwu is afraid of not having another opportunity to gain XP so quickly again. According to Jinwu Sung himself, he feels like dancing in the palm of Buddha's hand, considering everything he is experiencing without having any idea of how he got there. Meanwhile, Joey receives another call from the Hunter Association, being informed that the portal she was invited to defend has fallen victim to a dungeon break. She feels guilty for having refused the call, and remembering Junwoo's determination even in the difficult situation he was going through, decides to help once and for all. The association was lacking healers in this battle, and the city was in great danger. Junwoo continues to evolve non-stop until these hours of experience make him realize that enemies with white names are weaker than him, while orange ones are at his level and red ones are more powerful. He has leveled up so much that even the lichens now have white names instead of the red ones they had when he first arrived. However, even though he has evolved so much, Jinwu feels that he cannot defeat the boss down the staircase. Perhaps due to his increased perception, the feeling that he has no chance becomes more vivid. However, even though this monster gives him chills, he has reached level 15 and probably won't be able to level up in that dungeon. Moreover, the sword is becoming increasingly cracked, so it would be better for him to stop using it recklessly and go straight to where it really matters. Therefore, he descends the long staircase of the station until he reaches the lowest floor and as soon as he steps there, a giant fast creature crosses underwater to throw Jinwu against the wall and break his sword. 
The boy rises and sees that he's in front of the Swamp King, the blue kasaka of poisonous fangs. Even though Jinwu has evolved a lot, the boss's name is still Orange. And just by looking at the creature, he realizes that he won't be able to pierce those scales with just a sword. Therefore, the strategy is to endure the heavy attacks from the snake until he discovers a weak point. The problem is that, until that moment arrives, he needs to survive, and the way things are going in this battle, he might not be able to do that. After several powerful attacks in a row, the giant snake throws an entire train carriage at the protagonist, and this display of power makes him feel small, even after putting so many points into strength. Ultimately, he wonders how many points he'll have to invest in this attribute to stop being seen as a joke. Speaking of which, he remembers when he was called the weakest hunter in humanity. In an old memory, a man encourages Jinwu not to care about that nickname and to focus on proving to everyone that he is not what they say he is. Throughout his life, he has been ridiculed, and it made him feel ashamed of himself. When you are strong, you can handle challenges, help others, and be respected by those around you. On the other hand, when you are weak, you depend on the help of others and end up becoming a burden to your team. Society looks down on you, and even if you are intelligent, empathetic, or creative in the face of the strong, all of that becomes invisible. In the end, empathy doesn't win battles, and that's why Jinwu was so determined to become the strongest of all, to prove that he can make a difference. So he tries to climb the snake's scales, even without conviction that he would gain anything from it, but he's quickly thrown to the ground again. However, as he rises once more, a blue aura envelops the protagonist, and he knows well that this enemy before him is nothing compared to the terror he experienced with those statues. This mentality brings the necessary determination for him to keep fighting, and this time with more confidence. After climbing to the top of the snake, he manages to leap onto the back of its neck, and with the blessing of his numerous strength points, he begins to crush the scales of the blue kasaka with his bare hands. A snake tries to escape the opponent in every possible way, but Jin Wusung's strength is so great that the creature's head is severed. Exhausted, Jin Wu sees his own blood flowing throughout his body with the absurd effort he's exerting, while the gigantic monster lies dead in front of him, and his virtual menu indicates that he has leveled up several times. Moreover, he is rewarded with a dagger made from kasaka venom. In addition to having double the damage of Kim's sword, it has paralysis and draining bonuses. On the other hand, Jinwoo was afraid to use a venom gland he looted because the effect of this item is to harden the user's skin, but at the cost of the muscles being affected by Kasaka's venom. So he leaves this item stored away while receiving the notification that the dungeon has been cleared, and for this reason it will be restored to its original state. With everything back to normal, Jinwoo leaves the station and comes face to face with a soldier warning that the boy shouldn't be there after all, you should already be aware of what happened with the latest news. But shortly after this statement, the soldier notices the sword in the boy's hand and discovers that he's a hunter, and for this reason, he apologizes for everything he said and takes Jin Wu Sung directly to the ongoing battle. During the walk, a protagonist sees the wreckage of a dungeon break along the way, and the soldier warns that almost everything is under control, but the most dangerous creature is still missing. Through his perception, Jinwu feels that this monster is nearby through a blue light shining in another part of the city. On the other side of the buildings, a huge golem terrorizes the city, while ordinary citizens are controlled at a safe distance, and the hunters take the front line against the invader. The commander of the hunters tells the healers to do everything to keep the tank standing, but the damage dealers of the group are not managing to hit the monster enough because they need hunters who use magic. Jinwu notices that this group was put together hastily, so they have no synergy together. Moreover, there are 6 rank E and 2 rank D, so they are too weak for such a threat. Despite all this, he sees a rank B healer in the middle of the battlefield. It was Jolie being urged by the other healer in the team to do something useful, since she was paralyzed by fear. She tries to cast a healing spell, but the image of the evil statue invades the girl's mind and shakes her again. Jimu observes the difficulty of his friend and does not judge her because, in addition to witnessing the same trauma, he was once like her, consumed by fear and unable to react. However, not anymore. In the face of this creature, Jinwoo knows that it is of rank D, just like the giant snake at the station, so he has a chance to help in the fight. Therefore, he leaps towards the enemy to support the hunters and breaks the enemy's defense to leave it vulnerable. Thus, the rest of the group attacks and causes real damage to the opponent until they destroy the golem. The team's tank is amazed at the power of whoever threw that magical sword, considering that a group of 10 hunters was having so much difficulty facing this enemy, even in good numbers. Looking for the author of the magical strike, the tank asks a soldier who threw that sword in the middle of the battle, and the soldier looks back in an attempt to find the guy, but Jinwu was already far away. The tank wonders what level this hunter must be to be able to do that, while Joey seems to know that it was her friend who caused that turnaround in the fight. As for Jinwu Sung himself, he seems much more mature and aware of his ability, 
but he didn't even imagine that that single blow could cause all of that, so he believes that the golem was already quite weakened by the time he arrived. The next day, Jinwoo is hitting the gym hard. While some nurses comment on how handsome this patient is in addition to having an incredible body, when this patient arrived, he didn't attract much attention, but he hasn't stopped exercising since then and got ripped, and that happened too quickly for the short time he's been there. Shortly after, one of these nurses enters Jin Wu's room and sees him shirtless. She feels embarrassed for being attracted to the guy's body and ends up speechless, but soon she composes herself and informs Jin Wu that he'll be discharged today, asking how he's feeling. He replies that he's feeling great thanks to the nurses and her colleagues' work. The nurse thanks him for the compliment and informs him that he should go down to the reception so they can take care of the paperwork. Jinwoo feels grateful for the care he received and heads for the stairs, but before he leaves, the girl gathers courage and asks for his number. Innocently, Jinwoo thinks it's to send the test results to her after discharge, but he gives his contact to the girl. Meanwhile, on the Ultra Morning newspaper, the presenter receives a very special guest named Bak Yunho, one of the country's seven touring hunters. Due to his high level, the presenter asks if the hunter's daily life is very hectic and wants to know what he does when he's not in dungeons. Back replies that every day is a training day and that it's necessary in addition to always being in combat to keep reflexes sharp. But in his case, he has developed the habit of training all the time because he used to be a firefighter and in that profession, the smallest mistake can cost a companion's life and that thought has always guided his path. Jaina was watching this program before leaving for school, but she soon realizes it's time to leave, so she was to say goodbye to her brother. He had just woken up, so she informs him that yesterday's leftovers are in the fridge while noticing her brother's ripped abs. Therefore, she asks if he's been working out and if the gym makes you taller, since he seems taller now. Then she jokes that she didn't know men grew even after they got old, and then she gets ready to go to school. Before she leaves, Juno reminds her to take an umbrella, but Jenna finds it too heavy besides it's very sunny today. However, Jinwoo is devoted to the popular saying that prevention is better than cure, and stuffs the umbrella into his sister's backpack. With Jinna's departure, Jinwoo opens his training menu and sees that he has already completed all the day's tasks, except for the 10-kilometer run, which he left for later. As for the muscles he developed, he wonders if they are the result of the strength stats he has focused on more, or if he'll end up looking like a bodybuilder if he keeps working out. And speaking of that, he hasn't used the points he gained from the last level. Reflecting on where to allocate them, he concludes that strength is the most important to him, but that absurd damage is useless if he doesn't hit the blow. Therefore, it seems like a good idea to invest in agility. Vitality is good to have and perception has been very useful, but he's not sure about intelligence, it seems to be related to magic, so he's not sure if he needs it. Anyway, he decides to level up strength, agility, and perception. Right at that moment, the owner of the house he rents calls to collect this month's rent, as Jinwoo hasn't paid yet, and the tenant promises to pay as soon as possible. After ending the call, the protagonist looks at the screen of his cell phone and wonders if this experience he's going through is some kind of second awakening, but now that he can easily kill goblins, maybe paying the rent shouldn't be a much harder challenge. Instead, he prefers a thousand times to face a battalion of goblins. And maybe that's the solution to paying the rent, so Jinwoo enters a hunter's app, where they act in raid services in exchange for money. Jinwoo is looking for a higher level challenge to score some good money, but he imagines that nobody will accept a rank E in this type of difficulty. For this reason, maybe it would be better for him to ask for a revaluation and who knows, rise in rank to have more chance of getting higher paying jobs. However, Jinwoo remembers that he underwent a red awakening, and that this is extremely rare to happen. And the fact that he is a hunter who can level up would attract all the world's attention, and the press would throw all the world's expectations on his back. Because, as they say, the nail that sticks out gets hammered. So he decides to take a break until he learns to defend himself better and understand his abilities. And in the meantime, a notification arrives on his cell phone. Hours later, Jinwoo had just completed his daily run and went to collect his reward, which besides full energy recovery and plus three attribute points, gave him a random loot box. Then, a group of hunters approaches and their leader, Huang Dongsuk, is the first to greet Jinwoo. A guy who was right behind recognizes Jinwoo, remembering him as the weakest hunter in humanity. The other members of the group start laughing, but Dongsuk tells them to stop clowning around and apologizes to the newbie for the comments. Despite this, the boy doesn't seem as psyched as he used to be in the past and soon asks the team leader about the next steps. Dongsuk informs him that they're going to a C-ranked dungeon, and they need at least eight people to enter, and at least half of those eight need to be ranked C. Since Jinwoo won't fight, he won't be entitled to a share of the loot that they will pay two million for participation. As the man spoke, Jinwoo analyzed that the group has four C-ranked members and two D-ranked members. 
So he agrees to the terms and asks what his role is in this raid and the boss replies that he'll carry everyone's luggage such as food, clothes, and equipment in addition to a first aid kit. Jinwoo asks if they intend to go without a healer and the leader recalls how difficult it is for independent groups to find healers, but as they've always done without a healer, they have experience with it. Jinwoo understands the reason, but thinks it's crazy to enter a dungeon with practically only tanks. Then Huang passes the pen for the young man to sign the contract and he reads that one of the conditions is that the group is not responsible for anything that happens inside the dungeon. Still, he signs and hands over the document. Soon after, the last member to meet the quota arrives on the team, a 21-year-old D-rank hunter named Yu Jinho. Despite his low level, the guy sported one of the most powerful and shiny armors and right off the bat, everyone figures he must be a rich kid. Yu Jinho assures he'll protect the protagonist and they all set off for the mission. During the hike, Yu asks Jinwoo if he's okay since those backpacks seem heavy, and Jinwoo thanks him for the concern but says he's fine. Later, the 21-year-old starts recounting the story of the former company president they were passing by who fled abroad two months ago, taking away 900 billion embezzled. Seeing Jinwoo's disinterest, Yu apologizes for not being aware of when he's bothering others. Arriving at the portal, the team notices it's too big to be a C-rank, but Huang confirms that the association checked twice. You ask the new Kali if they shouldn't worry more about the size of this portal, but Jin Wu Sung informs that what matters is not the size but the level of magical power emanating from within, and that's what the Hunter Association evaluates when classifying. Dangerous dungeons ranked B or higher are handled by larger guilds. Those ranked C and below shouldn't be as dangerous. He compliments the bag carrier's knowledge on these matters, and he recalls he's been a hunter for a long time even though he's never entered a C-rank portal. Finally, the time has come, and they all cross the barrier into the dungeon. Since it was very dark, Q1 casts an illumination spell, and everyone is confused by the fact that this dungeon has no monsters and is completely dark, unlike others which are filled with glowing stones that light up the place. These cave characteristics remind Jinwu of the Kartnan Temple, where all that tragedy happened. At this moment, the colleague in shiny armor asks him what those glowing stones are, and he explains they're rocks that emit a faint light, quite common in cave-type dungeons. With this new information, Yu recites all the stones he learned about, including the essence stone obtained from magical monsters, the mana stone, which can be mined from dungeons, and this glowing stone, which illuminates caves. Yu finds it easy to confuse them all, but the bag carrier promises he'll get used to it. As the group reaches a part divided into three paths, he gets tense and thinks there's nothing in this place, so he asks Jinwu if there are dungeons without monsters, but the protagonist tells him to be quiet because his perception indicates that a strange sound is coming from somewhere. Therefore, magical monsters are around there somewhere, just haven't shown themselves yet. With the discovery, the team prepares for any imminent threat, while Jinwu wonders what kind of creature hides in the shadows and is attracted by light and soon concludes they're insect-type monsters. At this moment, sounds coming from all sides seem louder and more intense, and the whole team seems like they're going to panic because they can't see any enemies. They look to all the tunnels for any sign until a bunch of giant ants emerges from above. Apart from Q1, the archers try to prevent the enemies from getting close, but soon they manage to reach the ground. Therefore, Dongsuk uses a provocation skill to attract all opponents to him. And with this protection, Q1 has time to cast a powerful spell that eliminates several enemies at once, giving the rest a chance to advance toward victory. Watching the fight, Jinwu recognizes that this team is very well coordinated, and indeed, they must have been fighting together for a long time. And as for Yu Jin Ho, it seems like the equipment makes up for lack of skill. But you know they're doing well, something doesn't seem right in this story. Soon the battle is won, and the members divide all the essence stones among themselves. Dong Suk thanks the bag carrier's perception for anticipating the trap, and Jinwu replies that it's just part of his instinct. However, Q1 notices that many ants weren't killed by sword or magic strikes, so the group thinks there might be a stronger creature in that place doing so. Meanwhile, Yu tries to brag about the ant he killed, and Jinwoo asks where he got that expensive equipment from. So the boy replies that his father wanted to give him something nice for his first raid. Therefore, Jinwoo asks the young man to be very careful. Outside the dungeon, the master of a guild, Bak Yunho, is smashing a huge stone in one blow during training. Then he states that wasn't even the warm-up and orders someone to clean up the debris. Back in the cave, Jimu is commenting to the new colleague that making money without fighting is a good deal, but deep down, the protagonist feels it's almost too good to be true since he still has a nagging feeling. And as they walked, everyone observes various insects injured along the way. As they light up the route, they notice the entrance to the boss chamber and continue the journey. Further into the cave, they discover tons of mana crystals. 
Therefore, one of the members comments to Dongsek that even his brother would be envious and Kyuan tells the boy not to mention the leader's brother's name. In the meantime, the leader was thinking about how even his youngest is sometimes right, and he's going to use these resources to develop his attack team and not be subservient to him anymore. Meanwhile, Yuan read Jinwu's contract and is going to contest a clause with the contractor, saying that Jinwu wouldn't receive a share of the battle drops. But since the mana crystals are mined, the division should be by eight. Dongsuk smiles and confirms they'll do that, but first they need to deal with that giant spider up there. And since the portal closes once the dungeon boss is destroyed, Everyone needs to mine as many crystals as possible before facing the arachnid, taking advantage that it's asleep. Then he asks a member about the excavation equipment, but he replies he didn't expect to find so many minerals, so he left the tools in the car. Therefore, Dongsert decides to go back to get everything, and tells Yu and Jinwoo to stay there in the meantime since the spider is full and shouldn't wake up. Despite Yu's outrage, they leave, and at that moment, Jinwoo remembers the group's claim that they always tackle rank C dungeons without a healer. So he wonders why they didn't have any known hunters to call instead of him and Yu. During his reflection, Dong Suk instructs Kyuan to seal the boss chamber, dropping debris at the entrance to prevent the Du's escape. Consequently, Jinwu recalls a moment when a man said that in this field there are always scoundrels, because missions take place in isolated locations, making it easy for crimes to occur. Therefore, sometimes the weaker ones are left as bait, like a lizard leaving its tail behind. In one of those tales, Yu Jinho punches a mana crystal, lamenting having to die over a simple division of assets. He thinks that perhaps he would have lived if he hadn't mentioned the contract, but Jinwu knew that the group was ready to kill them at the first wrong move. However, they didn't need to get their hands dirty with blood since the spider finally awakens, while Yuma instructs the baggage carrier to protect himself behind him. Jinwu is analyzing escape routes, thinking that some tunnels in the vicinity would likely be the exit the Dongsu group would use. Looking back at the dungeon boss, he considers this an unfair battle, but when memories of Kartnan resurface, he asserts that he will handle the spider alone. Meanwhile, Dong Suk's group retreats until the conflict is resolved, and one of the subordinates asks if they should leave the two inside instead of just finishing them off. The leader explains that doing so would wake up the spider, risking them not being able to return to collect the resources they desire. But with the two trapped inside, the spider will eat them and then go back to sleep, giving them time to gather everything undisturbed. Plus, with that playboy dead, Yu Jinwu, they'll be able to get that shielded armor, which alone must be worth around 10 million. So even if they don't have time to extract the crystals, just that will fetch a high sum. Speaking of the boy Jinwu, ironically, Dong Suk comments that they should see which wealthy family he's from because it would look bad not to attend the funeral. Next, Qiwen questions if the spider won't be mad because of the noise they made collapsing the entrance. Then, Dong Suk responds that, regardless of her mood, they are in a group and can handle the situation, unlike those two low-ranked brats, who no matter what they do, will end up in the spider's belly. In the meantime, Jin Sung seems confident that this won't be his fate, while Yu tries to convince the protagonist that he would need to be at rank B to defeat this rank C boss, or at least be on the same level as the arachnid, but extremely well-equipped, which isn't the case. And despite the confidence, Jin Wu agrees with his companion. Even with the resurgence, he is still weak, and the bosses he faced, like the Blue Kasaka and the Golem, were of lower ranks than this boss now, which means he's facing a much bigger challenge than before. Despite this, Jin Wusung doesn't flinch in this situation, and something inside him keeps affirming that he can handle this spider after all, he's at level 18. So it's worth a try. With that, he advances towards the enemy, and living up to the title of hunter he possesses, Jin Wu begins his hunt. In the meantime, Gogani, the president of the Hunters Association, is tired of these meetings with politicians and energy companies he's forced to attend day after day since he's never been good at politics. That's why Wu Jinshul invites the boss to a training battle to relax a bit. So the Go jokes that the veterans try to retire, but the younger ones keep asking for advice, keeping the old ones active. Meanwhile, Jinmu is seeking a way to hit the opponent since he's having trouble penetrating the exoskeleton with his sword. Furthermore, he needs to pay close attention to the spider's attacks because one of those paw strikes would be enough to bury him alive. And watching the fight from behind, you notices that guy there is nowhere near an E rank, so he definitely falsified his rank. He's just another one of those crazies who pretend to be weaker than they really are just to take on lower challenges and kill for fun. And as he convinced himself of that, he wondered more and more where he ended up. Meanwhile, Jinwu was getting more and more tired and seeing his speed gradually decreasing, which means he needs to find a way to turn this game around before he becomes an easy prey for the spider. That's why he rummaged through his inventory to see if he could find a solution, and he sees in the venomous fang of Kasaka the hope of defeating the enemy with its paralysis and draining powers. Therefore, the hunter must find a weak point to penetrate the spider's skin, 
and the dagger's poison would take care of the rest. However, the enemy had a trump card up its sleeve, releasing acid onto the battlefield and showing Jinwu that he couldn't approach thoughtlessly. But still, the protagonist doesn't have much choice, because if he tires too much, he'll become spider food. For this reason, he uses his new ability called Sprint to speed towards the rival. Thus, the 10 kilometers run per day seems to have some effect on the strength of the boy's legs, who is launched like a missile towards the dungeon boss, giving him a chance to attack with his dagger on her face. However, even this part of the arachnid's body was extremely resistant, so Jim Wu starts losing his cool and desperately attacking every part of the body he can, but this impatience led his body to reach a fatigue level of 70, further limiting some of his movements. Faced with slowness, the spider manages to hit the human and throw him to the ground with force. So Jin Wu seemed resigned to his fate, but when the enemy was about to end the fight using its claw, he uses a full recovery bonus and replenishes his energy. This time he couldn't mess up, so in his new attempt to attack, he unleashes numerous dagger blows on one of the spider's eyes, throwing all of the Kasaka venom onto the spider's body. Thus, in a few seconds, the dungeon boss falls to the ground without a chance to react. With the victory, Jin Wu instantly levels up a few levels. While feeling relieved that he didn't use all of his total recovery rewards from his daily training runs because without them, it would have been quite complicated. Meanwhile, Yu is simply astonished by what he just witnessed. He simply can't believe that the ranky baggage handler from his expedition group was able to defeat a giant rank C spider, so now he's sure the guy falsified his real level. And during his thought, the protagonist collects the essence stone from the cave boss and wonders how much such a thing must be worth. And being no fool, Yu already puts his colleague's baggage on his back and hands him a bottle of water while asking him to rest, while Yu himself digs up all the crystals from the location. Jin Wu Sung doesn't understand the reason for the strange behavior, but this is put on the back burner when Dong Suk's group emerges from one of the cave entrances and notices that the two rookies are still alive. At the same time, the experienced Go Gun He agrees to practice with Wu Jinchul and shows that even though he's old, he still maintains an incredible shape demonstrating incredible strength by subduing the hunter's surveillance administrator. Jinchul recognizes the president's strength and thanks him for having had the opportunity to train with him. While the leader demonstrates great humility and leadership by praising the subordinate's development and emphasizing that even if these exercises don't raise Jinchul's rank, it's still possible to practice and polish new techniques that can be useful in dungeons, where danger is always extreme and people's true nature really shows. And this nature becomes more evident in Dong Suk and his team as they delve into the chaos and upon seeing the spider carcass conclude that it was probably a much weaker creature than they imagined to be defeated by two weaklings like that. At least that rich kid Yu's expensive armor seems to have tanked the dungeon boss. So Dong Suk remarks that this rich kid's equipment seems to be quite useful and asks if his father is Yu Myungin, president of Yu Construction. Since the guy didn't deny it, the leader sends a proposal to him where he should finish off Jin Wu Sung to become an accomplice to everything that happened there and have his life spared. Dong Suk had no intention of keeping the daddy's boy alive, but seeing the dungeon boss's corpse there on the side, he fears that this armor might have some special bonus that he can't predict, so he wanted to expose the user to a new conflict to analyze the real power of this equipment. Faced with this, Dong Suk pressures you to do what he says, as what happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon. So the boy approaches Jin Wu, leaving Dong Suk anxious for what's to come, but he turns against the group who then prepares to deal with a weaker enemy before you. And at that moment, Jin Wu Sung receives an urgent mission, where he should eliminate any present threat to ensure his own safety. And if he doesn't complete this mission, he'll suffer a penalty. However, the challenge shows that it wouldn't be so easy, as Q1 unleashes a lightning bolt on the protagonist that isolates him far away. Meanwhile, three friends meet at a cafe and a green-eyed girl named Heejin is asked about how things are going at the White Tiger Guild. She replies that everything is as it has always been, while her blonde friend, Gina, says that the Hunters Association is also the same. Then Heejin asks if it's true that Gina is going to start an A-rank dungeon training with Cha Ha, one of the guild's legends. Gina explains that it has already happened, and on that occasion, they were having problems with a powerful creature from the elite dungeon until Cha Ha ended the monster as if it were the easiest thing in the world, leaving everyone amazed, but especially Kikumun since he was a candidate for captain of the attack squad. By the way, Jenna asks about that guy, Chul, who also intended to be captain, but Heejin doesn't think he's anything special. But despite everything, we're still in the Hunter's Guild and the White Tiger, the biggest ones so far, unlike other organizations with sinister stories about mysterious deaths of their members in dungeons. In the meantime, Jim Wu seems dead in the eyes of those present, but he still lives, reflecting deeply on why the world is a place of so many lies and betrayals. Jim Wu was careless again and underestimated the evil that people are capable of, and this time, even the system that guides him wants him to kill people. 
Strangely, it seems that this device wants to keep him alive and strong. And since the system wants to use Jinwu, Jinwu will also use the system. As he slowly advances against the enemies laughing at him, the protagonist thinks about how the law of the jungle prevails in such places. Then Junti asks to lead the world's weakest hunter with him, then embraces Jinwu and asks what an e rank fool can do against them with his arrogance. Therefore, Jinwu shows in practice what he had in mind by separating the enemy's head from the rest of the body. Dong Suk knows that Junti was careless, but still, he was a D rank. The E rank that ended his life doesn't feel so bad for having killed his first human, after all, he has no choice, and if only the strongest survive, Jin Wu Sung will finish standing. With that in mind, he moves like the wind towards each of his enemies and knocking them down one by one without giving them a chance to be touched. Even the talented Qi Wan is eliminated second to last without much effort, until only the leader of the expedition group, Wang Dong Suk, remains. Seeing his team being massacred in a few seconds, the boss realizes who really killed that giant spider. But unlike his subordinates, Dong Suk is a distinguished C rank hunter, and he shows it by using his enhancement ability. Soon he analyzes that Jinwu must be tired after facing the spider and his companions. Besides, his strengths are speed and the poisonous dagger, but thanks to Dong Suk's enhancement, his body has become as strong as steel, so the dagger won't be able to penetrate his skin. However, Jin Wu Sung shows that having spent all this time leveling up makes anyone of C rank seem nothing compared to him. So he throws Dong Suk's head on the ground, realizing that he has no chance against that hunter. So he begs for mercy and swears that he will pay whatever Jin Wu Sung wants if spared. But the protagonist remembers that this man tried to kill him three times and now comes to beg in such a ridiculous way. And as Dong Suk himself said, what happens in the dungeon stays in the dungeon. Faced with the end, the man tries to flaunt his influence, warning that he is the brother of someone important, but Jin Wu couldn't care less and ends the service right then. Later, the guild investigator isn't buying the story that all the C ranks were wiped out and only the D and E ranks remain. Besides, the protocol officer takes a look at the Playboy's car, seeing that it's the Carrie and Longsworth from Maya Company, and gets excited about this new release she's been waiting for. Meanwhile, Jin Wu sees the rewards from the mission, where he notices this skill, Killer Intent, which reduces all enemies' attributes by half and can be applied to multiple enemies at once. After the investigation, Yu is thanking Jin Wu Sung for everything that happened in the dungeon, but the protagonist is only concerned if his sister is using the umbrella he asked her to take earlier today. Meanwhile, on a high altar of a building, a new character is about to be revealed. The next day, news reaches Jin Chul that six hunters were killed in a C rank raid, with only one D rank and one E rank survivor. Jin Chul initially assumes it's another case of weaker members fleeing after the stronger ones were killed, but his assistant reveals that both survivors left the dungeon after defeating the boss. Yu Jinho, the D rank, possesses expensive equipment, and the other survivor is Jin Wu Sung. Upon hearing this name, the administrator becomes pensive and more interested in the case. The assistant adds that one of the deceased in the dungeon was Dong Suk, Dong Su's older brother. Turning to the protagonist, his sister sees him returning home with fried chicken and asks what good thing happened for him to do this, but he replies he's unsure if it was good or not. He then reveals he saved money for their mother's treatment, while his sister jokingly remarks that he's finally stopped being stingy. Afterward, they sit together and Jina comments that Jin will return from the dungeon without a scratch, indicating his team must have been very strong. Jinwoo confirms they were indeed strong, while memories of the actual situation flash through his mind, a true massacre that Jinwoo Sung orchestrated without hesitation. Lost in thought, Jinwoo's sister asks what's wrong, and he pretends to be trying to remember if the group returned his raid change. Jaina is reassured by this explanation, and Jinwoo reflects that as long as he stays alive and protects his family, everything will be fine. If that involves repeating what happened in the dungeon, so be it, he'd do it all over again. Suddenly, a message arrives informing the protagonist of a harmful substance in his body, but the system quickly notifies him that he's been detoxified. Thus, he bids his sister farewell and heads to his room. Upstairs, he realizes he can't get drunk even after consuming many cans of beer because apparently the system has a function that breaks down alcohol. Pondering this, he searches until he finds one of the rewards for completing the mission, an ability called Blessing, which grants him immunity to toxic and foreign conditions, as well as enhancing his regeneration capacity. Realizing this was the reward from the double dungeon, he understands how he was able to regenerate his severed limbs. As night falls, Jina informs her brother that someone named Yu Jin Ho is on the phone. Seeing beer cans scattered around the room, she advises him not to drink so much as it's bad for his health, and when she becomes a doctor and has to treat him for it, she'll refuse. Sometime later, Jin Wu meets with Yu and comments that he didn't expect to see him again in this life. 
After the D-Rank thanks the protagonist for saving his life, Jinwoo thanks him in return for never revealing what truly happened in that dungeon. This makes you nervous, arguing they acted in self-defense, and then tries to invite Jinwoo to form a group. However, before he can finish the sentence, Jinwoo interrupts and declines in advance, saying he doesn't intend to hang out with the daddy's boy. Despite this, you pleads with him to listen, promising he'll be well rewarded. He finally gets Jinwoo's attention and explains he needs his help to complete 20 raids and obtain a guild master license. Since he studied to take over his inheritance, passing the theoretical exam wouldn't be a problem, but the practical part is another matter. Taking the conversation, Jinwoo asks if the boy is the second heir of Yujin Construction. And after confirming, Yu mentions his father wants the company to have his own guild. Jinwoo presumes his father wants to enter the hunter business to be self-sufficient and profit independently from raids. Yu confirms this, adding that the idea is to have an S rank as master and his brother as vice commander, managing the guild like a company. Jinwoo remarks that finding an S rank will be difficult as there are only nine in the whole country, and the only one without a guild retired, Min Byung-gu. Furthermore, if Yu's father wants to attract a higher S rank, it will create friction between the two guilds. Seeing the hunter isn't very confident with this plan, Yu's more assertive, stating Jin Wu Sung needs partners to join raids while hiding his own rank, and for Yu, it's better to do these expeditions alongside an E rank rather than looking for someone higher level. After his declaration, the boy reflects alone that the boss of the next dungeon they plan to invade might be a B rank or even higher. Then he shows the guild project, mentioning the estimated value for the headquarters building is 30 billion. And this will be the reward for the 19 C rank raids Jinwoo is supposed to participate in, the spiders being the first. Thinking to himself, the protagonist believes in the past he would have jumped at this proposal, but being the only hunter to evolve, he will surely become an S rank one day, perhaps even surpassing that if possible. Considering this possibility, the value is low for what he can deliver. Furthermore, not knowing how leveling up affects him, collaborating with others could be risky. So Jinwoo declines the offer and heads for the exit, but Yu insists one last time, saying if he accepts, he'll take Jinwoo Sung's secret to the grave. In response, Jinwoo looks back at the playboy with an expression that needs no explanation, and that seems to settle the situation once and for all. Later it's revealed that the man on top of the building is Huang Dongsu, Dong Suk's younger brother, who has just learned of his brother's death and begins to move his pieces. He demands the case paperwork from his secretary and asks her what would happen if he killed someone in another country. She explains that in a country with a hunter detention and extradition treaty, he would be tried in that country. If there is no treaty, he will be judged by the law of the country where he lives, possibly negotiating a reduced sentence with the government. Being very busy, Dong Su asks the secretary to make room in his schedule to resolve this situation. But as it would affect the guild, he'll have to wait until there's a gap in the programming. With that settled, he looks at the faces of the two criminals and hopes they'll still be alive when he arrives. Early the next morning, Jana and Jinwoo are exercising together, and in the middle of their run, Jinwoo asks what the girl would do if she suddenly came into possession of 30 billion. Jaina would pay for her mother's treatment, go to college, and maybe save the rest. She can't say why since it's never going to happen anyway. Jinwoo agrees and tells Jina she can run at her own pace, then he speeds ahead. Unable to keep up, Jana comments that the boy may be rank E, but he's still a hunter. In her absence, Jinwoo accepts the reward for another day of training, but before he notices that the system counted the run of the goal, tallying the 11 kilometers he ran instead of closing in at 10 as usual. To clear his doubts, he does two more push-ups and notices that this too was added to the goal, so he decides to see how far this could go. At that moment, Jaina had just caught up with him, but soon he leaves her in the dust again. After a while, he sees that the system has doubled the goal, so he questions what he ran beyond that. Soon he doubles the goal for all exercises, with 200 push-ups, 200 sit-ups, and 200 squats, which unlocks a secret reward, consisting of a blessed mysterious box and another cursed one. First, he opens the blessed one, revealing a key to enter the demon castle dungeon. Furthermore, it can be used in the Dasum Tower in Sampagu. The problem is that the acquisition difficulty of this key is level S, which worries the boy. Reading the mission description, he sees that in the Demon King's castle, he can obtain the ingredients for the life elixir, capable of curing any disease through powerful magic. At dusk, he visits his mother and, in front of her, wonders if this life elixir would be able to bring her back permanently. Holding on to this hope, he decides to pursue this goal. As he opens the portal to the dungeon, he thinks that the dungeon's difficulty could be rank S, just like the rarity of the key. Meaning, with monsters like those from Jeju Island, which even troubled rank as hunters. As he prepares to enter, Jinwoo questions whether he will be able to face enemies of this caliber. 
Entering the dungeon, he confesses to himself that he's afraid, but still, he has an instant teleport stone in case he's really threatened. And just as he takes his first steps inside, Cerberus, the Guardian of Hell, appears before the protagonist, who knows he can't turn back now, always keeping in mind the life elixir he can obtain from there. So he draws the Wolf Slayer Dagger, and using his sprint ability, charges at the three-headed dog. Cutting the creature's body several times, he recoils when he notices his attacks have had no effect even with the weapon's characteristic he carries. So he activates his new and stronger technique, the assassination intention, but Cerberus responds with a roar that nullifies the human's ability. Since that's the case, he returns to straightforward combat, but the paralysis and draining effects of the dagger still fail to affect the infernal dog. This time, Cerberus shows his business card and retaliates against the attack suffered, ripping Jinwu's arm off with a bite, only to then crush his body with his paw. Just with that, the hunter loses almost half of his HP, so he decides to be more cautious and retreats once again. Analyzing his opponent, he discovers that Cerberus is using his Fury ability, which doubles all user attributes for three minutes. But before devising a strategy based on this, Jinwu takes another blow and sees his life points drop even further. So he tries not to stand still in battle to avoid this kind of mistake. Activating his total recovery to regenerate his arm, he returns to the fight and pierces the enemy's eye. But a notification arrives immediately, warning that Cerberus is not feeling any pain. Then the dog isolates and crushes the hunter several times, who can't react to the unbeatable strength and speed of the beast. Meanwhile, Jinwoo sees his HP dwindling and the fact that he has dropped below 30% of life has imposed a dip off on him of minus 50% damage. Faced with the massacre, the system keeps notifying the player at every moment, making him realize that this is not just any second awakening. At first, he thinks of enduring Cerberus's three minutes of fury for a chance, but he soon realizes that it's too risky. So he pulls out his teleport stone to bail out before things go south, but a stomp from the enemy makes the stone fly out of his hand. Now his life was near its end and he was without the instrument that would get him out of there once and for all. At that moment, he searches the system for a solution, and he ends up remembering the store that the menu offered for potions and such. So he buys three basic healing potions, which heal a few life points. After that, he rummages through his inventory and sees Kasaka's poison gland, which hardens the user's skin but permanently damages the muscles with poison. However, Jinwu remembers that he obtained the blessing ability, making him immune to toxic effects. With that in mind, he only has one option left to try, so he ingests the entire substance and sees the blessing preventing the venom's effect. Cerberus appears to finish off the hunter, but when struck again, he feels that his body suffers much less from the opponent's monstrous impact. Moreover, the dog's fury has just ended, making him feel the absurd pain of his pierced eye. Noticing the turn of events, Juma goes all out, tearing into the body of the hellish animal. However, Cerberus manages to bite the protagonist, who feels his life slipping away, but at the same time, the hardening effect of the gland keeps him active. With that, he pierces the enemy's other eyes several times with hatred, causing a rain of blood that extinguishes the fire around. With the victory, Jinwu gains several levels in addition to obtaining the castle door key by defeating the Guardian, and the formula to make the life elixir, with three items needed to create this substance. After nearly losing his life in this battle, Jinwu knows it's best to enter this castle only after he's sure he can face what's inside. So he promises that one day he will return. As soon as he emerges from the dungeon, Jinwoo heads straight to visit his mother to see how she's doing and reaffirm his promise to make her better. There are three ingredients he needs to prepare the elixir of life and all he has to do is get stronger to the level where he can enter that castle and do what is necessary for her. To finance his goal, he goes back to you and reverses his decision. Now he will join the boy to conquer the 19 raids, but with the condition that they both enter all the dungeons alone. Facing this, Yu loses some of his excitement and reminds his companion that eight people are required to enter Rank C dungeons. So Jinwoo explains that they could hire the other members, just like Dong Suk did, and this way they could complete their missions without anyone from outside getting hurt. And in addition, this feat could even help Yu impress his father. Therefore, Yu accepts the requirement and asserts that he will take care of the preparations for the upcoming expeditions. Meanwhile, Cha Ha is in the middle of her running training when she notices a man watching her and asks what he wants. The man apologizes for interrupting her training, saying he didn't know the best time to approach the lady. Then Bianville hands her a card from Yujin Construction, Yu's father's company. At that moment, the businessman was talking to his youngest son about the appearance of the dungeons, which had caused significant changes in society, such as in its perception of the economy, the media, and even politics. As for his company, this change came in infrastructure, so necessary for everyone's life. 
There are no more sophisticated operations without the resources provided by these dungeons, and the only ones capable of collecting these items are the hunters. In turn, they are supervised by a public institution, the Hunters Association, which recruits, registers, ranks, and supervises each of its members. In addition, they oversee the portals that do not go to auction and take care of dungeon breaks. However, the association is still just a state service, so it does not aim for profit in these endeavors. Most of these vital resources end up in the hands of guilds, which are companies that hire hunters for this type of service, making it an extremely lucrative business. Guilds like the Hunters, White Tiger, Reaper's Fame Guild, and Knight's Guild are the largest in the country. In practice, they have a monopoly on dungeon profits, and the powerful owner of Eugen Construction does not want this to continue because these are necessary resources for human life and should not be in the hands of mere mercenaries who use all this money as they please. Yuju Construction has always provided services to society, and it is not going to change now, so its owner has decided to start his own guild. Listening attentively, Yujin who agrees but thinks to himself that hiring an s rank hunter to work with his brother could be very risky, but at least he won't go through it himself. At that moment, his partner was training and notices that the system is no longer counting the exercises he does above the goal. Because of this, he thinks that the cursed mystery box offered in the secret mission is out of reach at the moment, but he hopes that the random loot box he got will give him an item as valuable as the key to the demon castle dungeon. So he uses the item with this expectation but ends up getting a used bingo card. Reviewing his very high attributes, the hunter realizes that just three points are not enough to change anything for him, so he needs to find a more effective way to evolve. He thinks about facing that giant centipede in the penalty zone, but even today he is not sure if he would be able to defeat that creature, besides it is not guaranteed that he will gain XP in a punitive mission. Therefore, Jimu is content to find raid jobs for rank D dungeons. In another part of the country, Song Chiu duels with wooden swords, and the younger man praises his master for his performance. The more experienced fighter smiles and replies that he is not ready to lose yet, even though he lost his arm a few months ago and cannot give his all. Then he receives an emergency call and regrets it because Rank D hunters are usually not called for anything more serious than buying bread at the bakery. Facing this, his pupil asks why he doesn't retire and Shield agrees that an old man without an arm really shouldn't be much help anymore. Embarrassed, the student tries to explain that it wasn't what he meant, but Shield wasn't thinking of giving up anyway, as he would like to spend the rest of his life contributing in some way with something he considers useful for society and his family. Besides him, since surviving that famous macabre dungeon, Kim also has his concerns about what he can offer to the people he loves, and since then, he has been struggling to support his two little daughters in any way he can. His wife insists that this hunter business is very dangerous and that many people have died in these endeavors, but the family man needs to pay for a decent school for his daughters and argues that the association does not send low-rank hunters to dangerous dungeons. That case was a mere exception and won't happen again. That said, his wife calms down and puts her hopes in him. And at that moment, his little daughter asks if daddy is strong. Attentive, Kim replies that he is capable of defeating gigantic monsters and the child is impressed. In the Hunter Association building inside Master Choi's office, Bake complains that the interview he did was a total waste of time and that he has no intention of boasting on TV like an idiot. Despite this, Choi thinks that the s rank Hunter made a great impression with his poise and deep answers. Not satisfied, Bake accuses that this interview was surely meant for Choi, but was pushed onto him. Cho responds in a cynical manner because this interview required an s rank hunter, close to President Go and very dedicated to his work, and it really could have been him to do it, maybe. Tired of Choi's antics, Bake asks him straight away what he wants, so the guild master reveals that Yujin Construction is moving its pieces in secret to open its own hunter guild. Bake already knows this because some of his subordinates have reported receiving contract proposals, and so he believes that Choi called him there for a bigger reason than that. So finally, Choi asked a big favor of his colleague. Meanwhile, Lee Johee resurfaces after a long time, so we know she's still withdrawn after the trauma she suffered. Her mother expresses concern for her daughter and tells her over the phone that a B-rank hunter should be strong, but she fears her daughter might not be that type and could just be hindering others. So she wants her daughter to come back home and help with the family store, especially since her father also misses her greatly. Lee gets annoyed by this and tells her mother to stop meddling in her life. So if she hangs up and decides to do something to emerge from the shadows and rebuild herself, and as she gets up, she leaves behind her cell phone, which notifies her of a request for a D-rank raid. Back at the association, Cha Ha and Bait greet each other in the hallway, and then Cha informs Choi that she was asked to be the master of Yujin Construction Guild, but turned down the offer. Next, she asks what Choi and Bake were talking about before she arrived. 
In response, Bake recalls their earlier conversation while having whiskey alone about how Jeju Island has been completely ignored by society because it used to be a place of frequent expeditions and missions, but now it's become a forgotten place by everyone. However, Choi never forgot that place, nor what he went through there, and even though he holds an important position and is praised daily as the ultimate weapon of society, nothing frees him from the feeling that he should return to that place. For this reason, Choi has decided to return to Jeju Island soon, but he needs Bake and the others for that. Bak suspects that this is the reason for so many sudden new recruits, but Choi asks his companion if he also has reasons to return to that island. Soon, the images of that day come back to the hunter's mind and he laments for Yun Seok and Byeon. Meanwhile, in an isolated place, an elderly man pleads with someone that other people need to die. Jin Woo is heading out for a new mission, and his sister complains that even on holidays he doesn't let go of work, unlike before when he would return from the dungeons and stay on ice for a week. Therefore, she believes it's the result of his rigorous training. And Jin Woo confesses that he has managed to live in a more stable manner, so he leaves without even grabbing his things, leaving Jin up puzzled by his actions because he's not going to the corner store. Also heading to work, Chiul observes that he hasn't awakened any physical power, which means his sword is useless against magical monsters. Ironically, the martial arts he has dedicated himself to since forever are useless in a dungeon, ironically. On the way to work, he bumps into Jin Woo, and they both discover they're heading to the same raid. Chiul is startled by the boy's evolution in such a short time, and he's puzzled because he remembers Jin Woo had lost a leg that day, but the boy pretends that his leg had simply come back when he woke up in the hospital. Chiyo regrets that there wasn't a decent healer in that dungeon to accompany the boy, but fortunately, a young man like Jin Wu is completely healed. In turn, the protagonist is slightly embarrassed because that man still sees him as a weakling who needs to be cared for, but he humbly thanks him for his concern. Then, as they reach the portal, they realize it's a gathering of the same people who were together on that fateful day. Jovi, a close friend of Jin Wu and a B-rank healer, along with Kim and Kang. Except for the girl, the other hunters can't even look Jin Woo in the face because they remember well that the boy was left behind in that deadly dungeon, allowing the rest to escape. Jovi is impressed by her friend's surreal transformation being so fit and with his leg recovered, very different from when she visited him in the hospital. Jin Woo is surprised because he didn't know his friend had visited him in those conditions until a car pulls up and three prisoners get out, who will participate in the expedition along with the others. One of the detainees is already excited to have a hottie on the team this time, and asking her to ditch that guy and have fun with them. Jin Woo immediately frowns. Then Kang Tashik, a hunter guild's vigilant, tells the prisoner to shut up because none of the three prisoners came out of jail to go sightseeing. Along with him, a guild assistant explains that these handcuffed men will be part of the raid this time because the exodus of local hunters left the association with few remaining options. Chiyo rehearses a complaint because he doesn't want to fight alongside criminals but he has no choice but to accept this condition. These are convicted hunters who came to reduce their sentences, and they will participate in the mission anyway. Nevertheless, the association supervisor will keep an eye on them all the time, and since he's at B rank, he can handle three C rankers without any problems. Still, Jin Woo doesn't think it's a good idea for his friend to take risks on this journey, and asks Jody not to participate in the raid this time, but the healer is determined to enter that portal, so she decides to continue anyway. Thus, the prisoners are released and the first thing Kang Taishik says is that they know very well what will happen if any of them try anything different. Then he reassures the rest of the group, stating that the prisoners will be under his supervision, and then asks who will be the leader of the team on this expedition. Chiyo steps up for the role, but before that, he asks Jin Woo if he agrees with it. After all, seven people died under his command that day, and the bitter taste of that shame still haunts Chiyo to this day. Moreover, the people who survived were thanks to Jin Woo Sung himself, so he asks for this permission and bows to thank him sincerely for everything he did on that tragic night. However, Jin Woo asks the man to stand up, and when Shiel also asks Kim if he can lead, Kim turns his face and responds that he can do whatever he wants. With everything settled, leadership falls to Shiel, and the supervisor declares the start of the raid, so everyone gathers after all this time to embark together once again on a new mission. Already inside the dungeon, the group effortlessly eliminates all the enemies that appear at the beginning, and the prisoners seem to enjoy the bloodbath they are causing on this mission. However, the standout is Jin Woo Sung, who is frighteningly stronger than he has ever been, attracting the attention of the entire team. After finishing the first fight, Chi will ask the protagonist where he got that dagger, and he just scratches his head, avoiding the answer. Joey points out that he hasn't been injured so far, and facing this news, she jokes that maybe she won't even need to get involved this time. Observing the young man closely, Chiyo notices that not only his behavior is different, but also his aura. 
In the midst of this, the impatient Kang Tashik instructs everyone to proceed with the objective. A bit ahead, they come across a split into three paths, so they decide to separate to keep everything in sight. Tashik goes to the right with the criminals and Jinwoo, using his enhanced perception, discovers that the dungeon boss is on the left side but prefers not to reveal it to make the XP worthwhile. Thus, he invites Chiel and Johi to go with him on this path. The remaining members, Kim and Kang, continue down the middle. After some time advancing, the Dew faces more goblins, hoping that everything will remain like this until the end of the tunnel. Since the weakest hunter in humanity is present, this is definitely a low-ranked dungeon, according to Kim. However, his companion reminds him that it didn't go that smoothly last time they all met. Speaking of the boy, although he believes he won't be forgiven, Kim commits to apologize to the young man because, despite doing it for his family, he still abandoned his comrades and that is not the behavior of a valiant hunter. On the right side, Taishik observes the prisoners' thirst for violence, not satisfied with just the goblins they could destroy. He asks the men if they would do the same to these monsters if they were human, and upon hearing that they wouldn't hesitate to repeat the act, the vigilant is transported to the moment when a family man reports that three men abused his daughter, leading her to hang herself and his wife is hospitalized due to the psychological consequences of this heinous crime. To make matters worse, the criminals are hunters, and this pathetic justice system decided that participating in raids reduces the sentence for demons like them, while his daughter is buried forever seven feet underground. For all this, the inconsolable father offers 300 million to Tashik to deal with the criminals, and given the mission, the vigilant intends to lie to the department that the prisoners were ambushed by a horde of goblins. Following their own path, Kim and Kang end up in the central tunnel, where Tashik is fulfilling the family man's wish to make the condemned suffer before death. Seeing the arrival of the two hunters, he realizes that the dungeon boss is in the left tunnel, so he finishes the job and decides to change his plans. At that moment, Jinwu remembers that Tashik once visited the hospital with his superior, so he hopes the vigilant doesn't recognize him. A bit further, the hunters sees the damage in the central corridor, including Kang dead and Kim barely alive. Joey hurries to treat her companion, and as soon as the healer gives him a second chance at life, Chiel notices that those knife cuts and various non-vital points were not made by monsters. Still very weakened, Kim asks his comrades to give up because he won't survive this, but Jinwoo insists that the experienced hunter needs to make an effort to see his daughter again and to continue hating this man. Therefore, Kim uses his last breath to apologize to the boy and then peacefully falls asleep. Lurking in the shadows, Taishit tries to catch everyone off guard by attacking Joey, but Jinwoo saves his friend just in time. The Vigilant would love to take down the healer first to have less trouble, but the boy ruined everything. The team leader questions what the association member thinks he's doing, so the Vigilant explains that he only intended to fake the prisoners' deaths, but now he has changed his mind. He plans to tell the department that the prisoners tried to escape, killed the rest of the team, and then attempted to ambush Tashik, but met the same fate as their eliminated comrades. In response, Shield takes Kim's sword and steps forward for the confrontation, eager to face someone with a sword after a long time. As the opponent is rank B, the leader asks Johi to strengthen his physique and plans to rely on the weak defense that assassins usually have to win the duel. However, Tashik mocks the fact that an old mage without buffs is using a sword, considering that all his abilities are in magic. Chiel tries to demonstrate his technique by cutting the enemy in half, but it was just a clone. Jinmu watches the fight and internally wishes his partner were a bit faster, and the Vigilant acknowledges that the old man has his potential, but proves not to be enough by cutting his shoulder. However, Joey heals her ally once again, and Tashik begins to get fed up with the support his rival is receiving. So he decides to take down the healer first. However, Chiel reaches the rival in time and shows that he is not a useless old man because he used to be a teacher of rank as hunters. Still, Tashik knows that an old mage cannot keep up with the pace of an assassin, and with that in mind, he delivers several cuts to the adversary. When Joey tries to revive her companion again, her magic fails. Therefore, Chiel was at the mercy of the assassin, but when he was about to suffer the final blow, the mage invokes a fire spell that incinerates the enemy. However, it was another one of Tashik's copies, aware that the wizard would focus on the sword to make the assassin lower his guard against his magic. Thus, the mage realized it was checkmate, but this time Jun Wu Sung, the weakest hunter in humanity, saves the old man. Tashik asks who this kid is, and he states his name along with his rank. The Vigilant realizes that this guy would never be from the lowest rank because twice he had the reflex to block his attacks. And as he seems to be known by the rest of the group, he probably isn't one of those who use fake ranks because that kind of cheater doesn't leave witnesses behind. Consequently, Taishik realizes he's facing a second awakening, and on top of that, it's that weakling who was hospitalized after the double dungeon 
even though the mana meter only showed 10. Still, Jun Sung doesn't have much experience as a hunter, so the assassin thinks of using that to his advantage by drawing another dagger. At that moment, the E rank questions the reason for the vigilant promoting this massacre in the dungeon. Then he explains that he delivered justice by tearing apart three abusers of a minor, but Jin Wu saw that he toyed with Kim and Kang until their deaths, avoiding their vital points, so it's evident that justice isn't what motivates this guy. With that said, Tashik laughs as he remembers refusing the family man's proposal to avenge a defenseless little girl, not for the money offered, but because exterminating humans is much more pleasurable than monsters. Next, the two rivals clash in a duel that the spectators could barely keep up with, given the absurd speed both possessed. They have similar physical structure and techniques, but Tashik relies on his experience and cunning to emerge victorious. Thus, he kicks a handful of sand into the opponent's eyes to land the first stabs. However, the system alerts Jin Wusun that a new target is in play, and he must eliminate this aggressor seeking his death, lest he suffer a penalty. Therefore, Jin Wu warns the opponent that the system has now given him another reason to be destroyed. Taishik has no idea what system this is, and this ignorance challenges his conviction of having control of the fight. Assuming his target moves beside him at an incomparable speed, and upon seeing his face cut, the Vigilant feels the poison flowing into his bloodstream. He promises to retaliate with another surprise, then uses his stealth to conceal his body, scent, and sound. No one knows that Tashik possesses this rare ability because no one has survived to tell, and he uses this technique to strike the target unseen. Desperate, Jinwoo's friends consider intervening, but Tashik makes it clear he can cut both of them in the blink of an eye. Indeed, he thinks he can do the same to Jinwoo because of the deep cut he made in his leg, but the hunter uses his total recovery to surprise his proud opponent once again, who has no idea how many times the enemy can use this healing magic as he has never seen a fighter capable of healing before. In turn, Jinwoo loses another emotion, but he believes he won't need to feel anger to eliminate trash like that. Hearing his comment, Tashik laughs upon discovering that the young man also has blood on his hands, suggesting that they are in the same boat since they have taken the lives of other human beings. After all, after the hunters awaken, the world's rules change to accommodate them, and within a dungeon like this, the only law is that of the strongest. Tashik disappears again and tries to maintain his strategy, but Jinwoo detects his enemy through his bloodlust. Still, Tashik remains invisible and plans to keep it as a trump card until Jinwoo activates his assassin's intent and throws his enemy into limbo, then promptly plunges his dagger into his chest. With that, Tashik is no longer able to fight, and he decides to reveal the cause of so many deaths in this dungeon. According to him, the hunters are killing machines, and it doesn't make sense to expect them to be guided by common morality. So he is about to die now because of the natural selection that eliminates the weak links of evolution. However, as Jinwoo has exhibited an arsenal of unknown abilities, his rival believes he may not even be a hunter. And as he was able to defeat Tashik, the boy will no longer be able to pretend to be a mere E-rank. Jinwoo reveals that he is capable of evolving with each battle he wins, and Tashik observes that this young man's shadow extends to very dark places, and the more powerful he becomes, the darker the places his shadow will reach. After all, if you gaze into the abyss for too long, the abyss gazes back at you. With that said, Jinwoo collects the reward of a stealth rune stone, while reflecting on what he just heard. Deep down, he acknowledges that he keeps getting stronger and stronger, and the stronger he gets, the more something breaks inside him. Still, it's not time to turn back, so he tells his two friends to leave the dungeon because the rest will be taken care of by him. Incredulous, the companions watch their friend depart alone until he finally reaches the boss's door. Sometime later, Wu Jinchul, the administrator of the hunter's surveillance team, is on his way to meet the survivors of this dungeon, lamenting that he never suspected Tashik's sinister side. Soon, he meets Jogi, Chiul, and Jin Wu Sung, the same E-rank hunter from that time, almost unrecognizable. Firstly, he apologizes for what his employee caused them all, but getting straight to the point, the supervisor asks who killed Kang Tashik. Jin Wu is backed into a corner and realizes he will have to break his contract with you. But to his surprise, Chiul takes the blame for the Vigilant's death. Jin Chul asks how the man being a C-rank was able to defeat a B-rank, and he responds that it was all thanks to his team's healer, who is also a B-rank. Thus, the administrator accepts the version of events and announces that he will need everyone's testimony about the incident. Noticing Jinchul's A rank, the protagonist realizes he wouldn't stand a chance against him at the moment, while the raid leader comments that Jinwoo doesn't need to thank him for the trouble he was spared. Three hours later, the father who hired Tashik to kill the prisoners turned himself in, confirming that the survivors acted in self-defense. After this long day, Joey shows Jinwoo a stone and asks if he remembers what it is. A few minutes before that, the two were walking peacefully through the park, 
and Joey emphasizes how much her friend had changed in this short interval of time. Facing this, Jimu believes that each individual responds differently to the events that occur in their life. The healer agrees, but at the same time feels that she is too afraid to be a hunter and to take these transformations to the level that this profession demands. For example, she knows she should be participating in level A, B, or even C raids, but she prefers to stay in lower-ranked dungeons out of convenience or fear of surpassing herself. No matter how hard she tries to change this, she never manages to leave this comfort zone. Still, it was this way that she met Jin Sung and soon found herself healing the new friend in every moment they ventured together through the country's dungeons. At first, she would get angry seeing her companion getting hurt all the time, but over time, she started seeing it differently because Jimu always managed to survive regardless of the injury and his eyes continued to radiate life. After this outburst, Joey shows the stone that her friend had given her on one of these expeditions, determined to retire from the hunter career and return to her parents' home. Jimu understands his friend's motivation and accepts the gift back and informs her that he will call her to grab something to eat when he passes by one day. After this farewell, Jinwoo carefully examines Joey's gift while recalling the encounter he had with Jinshul at the exit of the last dungeon. A surveillance administrator was surprised that an E rank could handle a B rank like Kang Tashik, and therefore understands the reason for Jinwoo's second awakening suspicions. But as Uncle Ben would say, with great power comes great responsibility, and the young hunter attracted much attention after Dong Suk's team was decimated in the giant spider dungeon. Therefore, possibly his younger brother Dong Su will seek answers for his older brother's death. S rank individuals like him are not easily stopped by the law. They are capable of causing as many miracles as calamities to society, and considering that Dong Su intends to cause the second option, Jinchul recommends that the boy take his family and flee the country as quickly as possible. However, Jinwoo sees in this threat another motivation to develop himself because if he fails in this objective, he, his sister, and his mother will be buried together with the Sung family name. With this in mind, Jinwoo sets out for new missions with Yu Jinhu, but seems bothered by the group of drunken and injured people gathered outside to join the raid. Yu explains that he prioritized qualified people to be hunters, but who cannot work for some reason, or who are having problems passing the selection. But according to the hair, they will only serve to complete the team so they can enter the dungeon with a minimum of eight participants. Jinwoo observes that there is a child among those summoned, but his colleague explains that it is not against the law to call minors as long as they have awakened. Speaking of the devil, the mentioned girl mentions the lack of manners when referring to her, since she is a qualified hunter, but Jinwoo deflates her by politely reminding her that she is an E rank, with no experience in raids, but that in any case, she will just wait outside with the others. One of the summon asks if they are really going to earn 3 million each just to wait outside while you and Jinwoo do all the dirty work. The contractor confirms the payment but reminds everyone that they must keep these raids confidential, otherwise, they will have to pay a fine 10 times greater than the payment they will receive as stated in the contract. In the middle of this reminder, Jinwoo uses the stealth rune stone he obtained by defeating Tashik to incorporate the ability. When he turns his back, he was ready to start the mission with his new buff-boosting armor made by a refined Italian manufacturer, but when Jinwoo awkwardly drops the hair to the ground with just one finger, they both agree that this equipment is too heavy for the skinny playboy. With that done, before crossing the portal, Jinwoo comments that his companion forgot to take off his helmet, but the d rank hunter insists on keeping at least the helm. The mission begins, and some of those summoned from outside are content with the good life they have being paid to sit and drink, but at the same time, they believe that the two young people who enter have no idea what they are getting into. Meanwhile, at school, Jenna wonders if her friend Song Yi skipped class today, but not only did she do that, the girl is also killing time to fulfill the expedition contract, killing two birds with one stone. The rest of the summon estimate that the raid should last two hours, but after 60 minutes, Yu comes running back from the portal, making some believe that they deviated from the objective. But when the portal begins to close with Jun Sung's departure, proof that they killed the boss is thrown in everyone's face. The next portal is an hour's drive away, so Yu calls the rest of the group to finish the quota of three raids per day. With a well-established strategy, Jun dealt with the monsters while Yu mined whatever he could at each portal they crossed. Working day after day, without a break, the two leveled up like steps on a staircase, pocketing any threat that came their way. With his new stealth technique, Jun Wu tore through enemies unseen on the battlefields, and the flawless use of this ability granted him a level 2 sprint. Combining his stealth with a newly learned advanced grip and fatal blow, Jin Wu Sung devastated his opponents with the silent elegance of an arrow, all while the rest of the group pocketed 9 million a day without having to lift a single muscle. After another round of intense combat, Yu collected the loot while his companion rested a bit and analyzed the abilities he had been gaining while leveling up in the dungeons. 
Although useful, Jinwu doesn't have enough mana to use them for long, so he understands that he should focus more on the intelligence attribute. Besides that, after leveling up so much, he wonders if it's time to climb up to the demon castle, but he doesn't know if he can handle that dungeon alone considering it must be between B and a rank, according to his own analysis. Until suddenly, a system modification announces that Jinwu has reached the level required to request a class change provided he completes a mission for it. However, all this success began to attract the attention of important people, and the manager An Sangmin, from a multi-million dollar company, found out through his subordinate Kitchell that the youngest son of the owner of Yujin Construction is spending more than double the market value on C-rank portals, wanting to pay $150 million for the rights to dungeons of this rank. The manager believes that this could put the boy's father's company in the red, and that it's too much money for a daddy's boy to be playing hunter. However, Sangman discovers that the boy is not alone in this scheme, and that Jin Wu Sung participates in all formations of these raids. As the manager well remembers, this Jin Wu guy was involved in the double dungeon incident, so he feels that something is wrong there. While the heat isn't on yet, the two hunters continue to do their job normally and return earlier and earlier from the portals they invade. The outsiders are getting so bored that one of them asks to drive the van just to feel useful in some way, while Jun Wu suspects that the girl in the group isn't as satisfied as the others in this whole story. Besides her, manager Sangman is definitely bothered by the hypothesis that Jun Wu Sung has undergone a second awakening, considering that he was present in three serious incidents and survived them all. The first was the double dungeon, the second was the extermination of the Dong Suk squad, and the third involved the murder of vigilant Kang Tashik. In all these events, there were several deaths, but Jin Wu survived all three occasions, so Sagman believes it's a case of a reawakening. Listening carefully to every word, Kitchell asks what the boss will do after reaching this conclusion, and he announces that it's time to recruit a promising rookie. Arriving at the dungeon where the two hunters are, Sagman sees a relaxed picnic in front of the portal, until Song Ye arrives and warns that it's forbidden to enter there. The two men try to extract information without being invasive, and ask if the girl is part of the attacking team on duty, when she confirms, Sangman presumes that Jin Sung left the rest of the group behind to face the dungeon alone and therefore his interest grows upon sensing the boy's extraordinary potential. Satisfied with the information, the manager leaves with his subordinate, and at that moment the two invaders finish the job in the dungeon. Jin Wu wants to know about tomorrow's schedule because he would like to take a day off, since he remembered he has a commitment, so he postpones the raids for another day and moves on to today's next one. Eavesdropping on the conversation, we see that the young ones have already started to attract problems close by, and then we are faced with a chaotic nightmare that Master Choi often has involving infernal fire, demons, and events from Jeju Island. Haunted by his trauma, the leader of the Hunter's Guild is content to know that a new reconnaissance mission is about to take place in that cursed place. In the meantime, Jinchul is dropped off near his home after another day of work, until Saemin and Kichul approach the young man. The higher-ranking man introduces himself as An Sangman, manager of the second administration team of the White Tiger Guild, and asks for a minute to talk to Jinwoo. Getting straight to the point, he wants to hire the promising hunter for double what Yujin Construction is paying, and if he has more demands, the manager commits to chasing after them. Sangman is convinced that such a young man will accept an offer of this caliber, but instead of showing excitement, Jinwoo asks how much the man's guild building is worth. Not quite understanding, the manager calculates that it must be around 50 billion, so the hunter dismisses the offer because, showing the documents proving Yujin Construction's offer, he shows that he was offered a building with a market value of 50 billion, and since the White Tiger Guild committed to paying double, Jinwoo understands that at least the White Tiger Guild headquarters should be transferred to his name. The manager is left speechless because he doesn't even have the authority to offer a deal of that magnitude, so Jinwoo stands up and makes it clear that he knows he's being spied on. As a cut suddenly appears on the man's face, An Sangman understands the reason for the construction company's offer, because a reawaken with stealth technique is worth gold. Then the manager justifies to the invisible aggressor that the dungeon market is very scarce, and by researching who bought so many C-rank portals, he came across the name Jin Wu. That said, as only he and his subordinate know this, Jin Wu asks them to keep it a secret, otherwise, they will be the first on the suspect list. As Sagan agrees, the promising young man sits back down and laments monopolizing the C-rank portals, but warns that he needs to keep doing this for some time. However, he offers three portals for 300 million each, otherwise the White Tiger will be a long time without training its hunters of this rank. Indignant, Sagan mentions that the mana and essence stones of each portal are worth 200 million at most, but before asking Jinwoo to lower the price, the hunter himself agrees to sell the three portals for 600 million in total. After closing the deal, Jinwoo wants the money deposited by the end of the day, 
and then asks the manager to close his eyes and open his mouth to receive a gift. Then he pours a red liquid that heals the wound on the man's face and reminds him to keep his mouth shut. As the hunter leaves, Kitchell asks if the contract went through and Salmon replies that for sure that young man is worth much more than they thought. The next day, the protagonist receives a message from you confirming that the 600 million has been deposited into the account, and when his companion asks how he managed to sell the portals at this inflated value, Jinwoo replies that it's a business secret. In the meantime, Sangman discovers that the boy outsmarted him because there were other C-rank portals being sold for around 70 million within the jurisdiction of the White Tiger Guild, and at that moment, Jinwoo sends a message saying that now they are even, and therefore he will forget that he was being spied on. With that, the manager recognizes that it's 1 to 0 for the hunter, but is relieved to have paid the price for espionage and at least have obtained Jin Woo Sung's number, which would be enough for the moment. Meanwhile, the talented hunter drives to his class exchange mission. Far away from the city, he gears up to face this mission that appeared after he leveled up to 40 in the last raid. Jin Woo has already found two accessible dungeons with only special items, and the two he completed out of obligation were the penalty and emergency ones. This time, it seems to be optional, so the hunter has time to ponder whether he wants to do it or not. At the same time, the fact that he has time to choose makes him imagine that this mission is quite difficult, but in any case, it's definitely an important step to establish a class and get stronger, so he accepts it and a huge portal opens in front of him. Since Jinwoo hasn't done his daily training yet, he'll have to do it when he returns, but the excitement from the portal in front of him indicates that the game has finally begun for real. As soon as he enters, a warrior in red armor awaits the hero inside. Meanwhile, Yu waits with his father for the other participant of a meeting, until Jin Sung, Yu's older brother, shows up. Jin Woo Sung advances through the dungeon and doesn't see anything different about it, but the system warns that potions and access to the store are blocked, and it's not possible to recover status when leveling up. Therefore, Jin Woo knows he needs to be extremely cautious, keeping in mind that he can't leave the dungeon until he completes it. At that moment, an enemy knight approaches and attacks the hunter, who draws his dagger and strikes the target swiftly but the powerful armor he wears prevents any damage. Jinwoo doesn't have the same equipment, so he needs to be careful not to suffer a blow from a sword of that size. He dodges the attacks and prepares his fatal blow to knock down the opponent, but even this ability isn't able to pierce the armor. Then Jinwoo remembers facing enemies with an even tougher shell than this one, so he tears off the knight's head with his bare hands. The boy regrets wasting a fatal blow in vain, as he can't recover mana, but the other knights approaching seem unconcerned about that. Back at the meeting, Yu's father questions the boy for not even touching the food yet, but Yu says it's nothing. Then the construction company president turns to his eldest son, and asks about the progress of the guild creation, as all the S-rank hunters have rejected the proposal to join the clan. Jin Sung explains that indeed Cha Ha and Min Biang rejected the invitation, but that's not a problem because he's also in contact with hunters from Europe and the Middle East. If the construction company meets their demands, they will surely sign up, and this will be a similar case to Wang Dong Su's. Next, Jin Sung tells his brother that he knows he's working in secret, paying a high price for the rights to rank C raids as a way to carve out his space, but above all, you shouldn't get in his way. The young man is embarrassed by the reprime and relieved that they don't know he's accompanied by an extraordinary hunter. And this hunter is expending so much energy in his fights that he feels he needs a break. But at the last minute, he discovers an invisible enemy through stealth and dispatches it. Jin Wu is impressed to have to face monsters with this ability, and to make matters worse, a mage attacks him from afar. Faced with this, Jinwoo tries to analyze what's happening and notices that the armor resembles Kasaka's, giving the impression that he's revisiting old battles. The variety of enemies is great, but it's necessary to discover each one's weakness to have any chance. Knights need strength. Assassins need perception. Archers need agility. If Jinwoo doesn't put strength into his blow, a knight won't even feel it, and without perception, he can't identify the stealthy ones, but the worst problem is the mages. Since the hunter never invested in intelligence, he'll have trouble defeating them because he needs to conserve the little mana he has apart from his abilities. Speaking of which, the system indicates that his fatigue is increasing more and more, so the boy needs to end this soon. Meanwhile, Master Choi meets with a group of hunters because according to him, the time has finally come. Rummaging through the loot, Jimu obtains a high-ranked knight's breastplate, and since he never paid much attention to his equipment, he gives the armor a chance. Fortunately, it becomes invisible on his body, so Jinwoo won't stand out, and furthermore, this equipment hardly restricts his movements. Besides this item, a guardian's necklace and a knight's gauntlet are also in his inventory, and since Jinwoo feels he's leveled up, all that's left is to recover a little more from fatigue and move on to the next stage of the dungeon. After resting, he comes across a gigantic door and presumes that some big problem must be behind it, but as it's the only way, he has to go through it. 
So Jinwoo opens the door and feels a strong wind that gives him chills, but he advances until he enters a throne room, where the Red Knight is. Jinwoo begins to feel the same pressure he felt in the double dungeon, and all this intensity comes from Commander Igris, the Blood Red Knight. The name above the enemy is Dark Red, giving certainty that his level is far above Jinwoo's. Defending an empty throne, the commander quickly advances towards the hunter, and as he strikes with his sword, he cuts a pillar as if it were a twig. The exceptional strength and speed of the Blood Red Knight are unstoppable, and the agility he maintains even with a heavy armor proves it. Jinwoo tries to find a combat strategy, but the enemy's swiftness is suffocating. Until at one point, Jinwoo finds an opening to attack, and after much difficulty, manages to land his first blow on the rival, but nothing happens. In response, the commander strikes forcefully with his sword, and even though Jinwoo manages to defend himself with the dagger, he's thrown away. At least he noticed that both their speeds are equal, despite the knight being much stronger. Since the dagger doesn't penetrate that armor, the boy needs to find some way to face this monster, so he decides to discard his dagger and fight unarmed. Following the knight's code of honor, his opponent also disarms himself. Meanwhile, Director Go and Wu Jinchul stay late at work sorting out pending matters, and the surveillance team administrator warns that the moment is approaching. The director agrees and takes a call from Choi, who thanks Go for approving the operation. In turn, Go argues that in reality, this tragedy is still fresh in people's minds, making it easier for public opinion to support this kind of mission. Next, Choi asks if the director is aware that he's stirring up a hornet's nest, but Go is ready to shoulder this burden. Finally, Choi comments that the third raid on Jeju Island never left his mind. On the other hand, the fight between Jinwoo and the Red Knight seems about to end because even unarmed, the commander is still extremely powerful. After throwing the hunter against the wall, the knight unleashes so many consecutive punches that they bury the boy into the wall, with the last one nearly collapsing the entire structure. Jinwoo manages to dodge the final punch, but even though he defended against all the others, he feels like he lost about 500 HP. Thus, the best choice of his life was putting on the armor, because otherwise his luck wouldn't have been the same. Nonetheless, the knight manages to inflict significant damage even without his sword, so all that's left for Jinwoo is to try to outpace the opponent in speed. He then utilizes his sprint ability and charges towards the commander, but even though he's incredibly fast, he can't land a single hit. On the contrary, it's the knight who continues to strike Jinwoo whenever he desires. However, the passive ability of willpower is activated in the hunter, further increasing his speed. Nevertheless, he still falls victim to the opponent's powerful blows until he finally manages to rise again and test the boost in his agility. After an intense exchange of blows, all defended by Igris, Jinwoo lands a kick on the enemy, who becomes enraged upon suffering damage for the first time and uses that fury to pummel Jinwoo even more. The boy seems surrendered to this insane frenzy of the Blood Red Knight. After enduring this unstoppable sequence of attacks, Jinwoo ends up sitting on the throne exhausted. While her brother is on the brink of death, Jaina prepares some sandwiches for him and leaves a note informing him that dinner is in the fridge. Then she eats her portion of the sandwiches while studying, intending to visit her mother in the hospital afterward. With Jinwoo resigned to his fate, Egris retrieves his sword and tries to deliver the finishing blow, but the hunter shows that he hasn't been defeated yet by managing to hold the sword with his hand and then piercing the enemy's eye with his dagger causing darkened blood to flow from the monster. Expending his last ounce of strength and rallying against his own refusal to die, Jinwoo drags the knight across the hall until he smashes him against the wall. Egris pulls the dagger from his eye to retaliate, but Jinwoo retrieves the weapon back into his inventory and promptly thrusts it beneath the creature's chin. As it still isn't enough, the hunter uses his fatal blow to deliver the most potent attack he can, finally defeating Egris, the Blood Red Meg commander. After the fight, Jin Wu Sung reflects that his victory was pure luck because the enemy was vastly superior in every way and a small mistake would have been fatal. With Igris' defeat, the hunter secures four rewards. A bag with one and a half million gold, Igris' helmet, his first S-rank equipment, which reduces damage suffered by the wearer by 15% and increases strength and vitality by 20 points. Thirdly, he obtains the rune stone for the Dominator's touch. But since it doesn't specify the ability he would gain upon breaking the stone, he leaves the item for later. Lastly, he checks the instant teleportation stone, a stone that takes him out of the dungeon but cannot be stored in the inventory and will be automatically destroyed once the class change mission ends. In other words, Jinwoo realizes that this mission isn't over yet, and when several portals appear around him, the system warns him to survive as long as possible to accumulate points to reach the highest class possible. Jinwoo becomes worried about the number of portals, but he is relieved to see that they aren't monsters of Egris's level, even though there are many of them at once. 
At this moment, the hunter's helicopter heads towards Jiju Island. Jun Musung eliminates the enemy knights one by one, but the portals continue to release more onto the battlefield. Needing to spend as much time as possible without dying, Jin Wu uses his stealth to pass the time without being seen. He notes that it costs 200 mana to activate and an additional point for every second of use, with him having 190 mana. However, a mage disables this ability of the hunter, along with the assassin's intent. So Jin Wu is exposed again and ends up taking a sword blow to the back. After kicking the assailant, he realizes he only lasted 5 minutes and feels he can't endure anymore, so he grabs the instant teleportation stone to escape. But a knight lands a hammer blow on his arm, causing the stone to fall, leaving the protagonist alone facing dozens of enemy knights. Next week, we'll have more of this anime as soon as the new episode is released, so go ahead and subscribe to the channel, and don't forget to hit the like button below to support this video. See you guys.